boarders and welcome to board with video games the gaming podcast that strives for the right balance of coverage for games you play on your table and on your television we're a proud member of the psvg podcast network and thrilled to be part of the dice tower network as well i am one of your hosts kyle hyman and joining me on this co-op adventure the sommelier of spring break josh borboni how are you doing which i must say first though when we were going to record like two weeks ago, that intro made way more sense. <laughs> I think, if to be fair, I think it makes the same amount of sense to me now than it would have okay. been. <laughs> gotcha. I just, you know, you are the expert of spring break. You are the, you can recommend all the great spring break activities. Oh, I didn't know that I could do that. Yeah, you That's totally can. I, can I, I, I believe in your ability to do those things. Oh, hey, thanks. I didn't know that uh, that was my calling, but yeah. uh, I am yeah, looking you know, for a new job. <laughs> pairing notes about like what, what spring break goes well with, you know, let us know kind of like the hints and flavors that we'll see during our spring breaks. So, like, yeah, I think you got it all. Oh, I can't wait. Is this going to be an inside joke that is explained to me later or should I have already picked up on it? No, that's just it. I just was trying to look for oh. a, a, <laughs> okay. a, a, a good... <laughs> Fun intro because you know it was spring break when we were going to record, and you know, being a spring break, spring break's fun. Sommeliers have, I think, fun jobs. Probably, I don't know. Seems like it's kind of weird that be cool. spring break isn't a universal time for everybody because you saying spring break means absolutely nothing to me because our spring break isn't for another week. Well, that's because you all also have President's Week, though, don't you? Yes, we also have a uh, February vacation, yeah. Yeah, so that's why, like, because we don't get that. So we just have to have our spring break in March. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think you might catch me off guard every year if you really want to try. Because <laughs> I probably will forget <laughs> this by next year. <laughs> yeah, because our spring break was literally two weeks ago. So we're, yeah. yeah. Yeah, we had February vacation and now we have April vacation. Yeah, we, yeah, we, we don't have to get have that. a month off to have two weeks, two weeks <laughs> in every three months. I, I wish that we got that. That yeah, would be so uh, much nicer. I would yeah. take one day. We don't even have one day off from work. I'll take a day. Yeah. <laughs> we have, I mean, I have nothing off either. And, I've, and you know, we are recording on Easter. Easter, which, yeah. <laughs> uh, but yeah, I get no time off of work for that. Like I work Friday, I work Monday. Uh, though it was funny because at my previous places I've worked, um, we sometimes would ensure that spring break aligned with Easter uh, right. just so that they could have, so time could be off, but that, you know, they weren't giving it for a, a specific religious observation. It just so happened that, you know, Easter, that spring break always happened to be when Easter was very yeah. conveniently. So, <laughs> and you know, when Easter moves significantly on the calendar, you're like, Oh, that's just really weird that, you know, every year spring break just so happens to be that. Week. <laughs> so, yeah. But how have you been, sir? It's been a long time since we podcasted. Uh, yeah, it has. I've been okay. Um, <laughs> I don't have uh, anything great to share. Nothing monumentally great or terrible has happened to me. So I guess I should count myself lucky in that regard, right? <laughs> yeah, I think, you know, they they say no news is good news, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, it's just, yeah. You know, life's still throwing curveballs, still just trying to adapt, you know, doing the best we can with what we have. Um, don't mean to be a Debbie Downer. <laughs> well, I, you know, I don't think you're being a Debbie Downer at all. I think that's just a reality of life, it seems. Because I, I did have this, I don't know, assumption that when I became an adult, that things would just get quote unquote easier. Um, yeah. And that just doesn't really seem to be true at all, ever, right? The opposite happens. <laughs> yeah. So you begin to have to care more about things, and those are things you have no control over. Yeah, it's pretty great. It's I also yeah. feel like I disagree. <laughs> it's the well, worst. I mean, it's pretty great sarcastically. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. Yeah, I just it is weird because I, I did really assume that at some point in life it would just seem like everything was like together, you know. But then it makes me wonder did my parents really ever have it all together? It seemed like they did, but. They probably well, that was their job, either. right? Yeah, their right. job was to make it look like they had it together. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Yes. How about you? How about you? Oh, you know, things are just, it's a busy time of year right now for work and for school and for life. So everything is just a little hectic right now. But I guess that's good. I just went to a 
conference for a few days. And uh, so I was gone for like four days and now I'm back for about a week. And then I go to a conference again for five days, oh, so, <laughs> you know, in the midst of like what is legitimately like the busiest season of work for me, as well as class, as well as just everything else that's going on. So it's been a pretty big effort to try to balance things, but you know, we're managing, it's going okay. Um, and <laughs> we uh, decided to book our next Disney trip. Yeah. So we're, well, we are, so we are going to Disneyland this summer, but that's more of like product of opportunity because yeah. Eric, my partner's going to be at a conference that's at like literally across the street. Yeah. So she's just staying a couple of days and I'm just going to fly out when her conference is done and we're going to go for a couple of days. But then in February of 2025, we are going back to Disney World. So that's exciting, I guess. Nice. Yeah, that is exciting. So, yeah, we'll see. At that point, too, it's kind of crazy because I will be done with classes by then. I won't be graduated yet because I graduate basically a year from now in May of 25. But I only have three classes left. I have two classes this summer and one class in the fall. But then after that, it's just dissertation credits. So, That's awesome. Yeah, we're getting there. We're getting down there. So here's to hoping that this journey, which seemed forever long, not that long ago, like, not that the end is 100% in sight, but I'm like, well, basically, like a year from now, I will have to be defending my dissertation. So, wow, nice. Yeah, I should probably think about writing that thing, I suppose. <laughs> sure. You get sure. some time. Yeah, you know, I got a year. It's fine. No big deal. So, cool. Uh, but, Josh, you know, this is going to be kind of like an April Fool's episode for everyone because it is our March episode, but it'll come out April 2nd. Um, but I guess, you know, this is just one of those examples of, of life throwing us curveballs and us just adapting and going with it. Yeah. So, but hey, we're still here. We're still kicking. That's right. Um, but hey, let's jump into stuff because I have, you know, we have a ton of games about to talk about between the two of us. A whole bunch of news stories that have happened over the last month, even though I think most people say it seemed like a quiet month. There's actually sure. kind of a lot of little things that happened that we could potentially talk about. And then some surprises. I want to spring on you, Josh. Oh, I love surprises. <laughs> well, <laughs> we'll see if you do. But with that, thanks so much for joining us this month, everyone. As always, if you have any feedback, questions, or suggested topics, hit us up at Board with VG on Twitter or check out all the awesome stuff over on the Instagram, also Board with VG. We are proud to be part of the Place of Video Games podcast family, and we encourage you to check out all the shows like the PSV, P, PSVG podcast, the Nintendo Shack, PSXP, whatever else they might be doing. You never know when a new show might pop up, so be sure to stay tuned to all of your favorite PSVG podcasts to stay up to date. We're also a member of the Dice Tower podcast network, so if you enjoy our conversations about board games and would like to dive deeper into that world, we encourage you to check out the Dice Tower podcast archives as well as all the other members of the network. No matter what type of board games you enjoy, there is a podcast on the network that is right for you. Josh, over the last multiple months, really, our what we've been playing has like been has dominated our shows because we've just played so yeah. many games. And it looks like, again, we have played so many games, though, granted, many of mine are like 60 minutes of experiencing these yeah, games. So I think mine that, are the same. <laughs> <laughs> what have you been playing, sir? Yeah, I have some quick hitters, but uh, honestly, um, with the exception of like the uh, my social game nights with friends, I have, have been in a gaming slump again. I thought I was out of it, but I think it was just a temporary thing. Um, that being said, uh, oh boy, um, what do I want to even say that I've been playing? Uh, I'm still playing my D and D campaign, the uh, Planescape uh, multiverse. Uh, gameplay yeah that's still a lot of fun we did have some time off too because people couldn't make certain nights so uh the nights that we couldn't make i've been playing Baldur's gate 3 still still continuing uh learning the lesson of uh save scumming uh should be doing it more <laughs> because yeah. it's a very unforgiving game um so we've been Having to load some saves with up to up to forty minutes old. <laughs> oh wow! Uh, just because we got stuck where we just can't get out of, it and there was not an auto save between the last save and where we were, so um, that's been challenging. <laughs> it's still I, fun though. <laughs> yeah, let me let me ask you something. We're just going to kind of weave some stuff into here because yeah. this isn't listed as one of our stories to potentially talk about. So I just thought I would throw it out there. So, um. They announced that they're moving on from Baldur's Gate 3, right? Like, they're not going to do any DLC. They're just moving on to their next thing. Uh, how do you, like, does that seem like a good idea? Do you think DLC should be made? <laughs> it seems like, you know, Baldur's Gate 3 
biggest hit, uh, you know, of some time from the, yeah. from that type of RPG or that type of game, obviously game of the year for many people. Do you think just moving on and uh, not doing any DLC is a good idea? It also was noted somewhere recently that Wizards of the Coast made like $90 million off of Baldur's Gate 3 for basically yeah. doing nothing. Uh, so what what are your thoughts on no s- further support? Obviously, patches and things like that, you know, for that kind of stuff are coming, but no DLC, anything like that. Uh, Larian is like, we're moving on. What, what do you think? I love it. I think it's great. Like they're sticking to their mission of of you know putting this game together and Mm -hmm. and you know they're essentially saying hey like we worked on this for ages in early game development and we took like people's advice and changed what we could and you know the the experience we're giving you is a full one we didn't like if they don't feel like they have to do dlc uh, i think that could be that is something that more games should take note of um like um, I, you know, as a business, do you want the money grab DLC? Yeah, absolutely, right. Um, and if, but if a studio just says like, "Hey, this is our our vision. We delivered on it. We're happy with the product." Like, don't force them to make DLC because uh, then you kind of get slop- sometimes you get sloppy stuff, especially under deadlines. So, uh, and how many how many hours is potentially this game? Like, right. does it really need DLC? Uh, so no, I like it. I like that idea. Do I think some games should get DLC that they, that don't? Sure, absolutely as well. So uh, it's also a game a game by game basis, but I think for them think, it makes sense. Yeah. Do you think they go back to because supposedly there's like two different games they want to make. That doesn't necessarily mean, I don't know if they've been clear about whether they're going to make them concurrently or one after the other. I mean, do you think they go back to Divinity and try to be like, hey, Baldur's Gate, which was you all loved, this was the thing that we did so that we could make Baldur's Gate come yeah. to our cool thing. I mean, do you think that's where they go back to, or do you think they do something completely different? You know, I don't know. That, that's a, that's a, that's a good question because are they burned out on RPG? Do they want to try something different, right? Uh, or do they want to stick to what they know they can do very well? I'm sure Divinity fans are dying for a third one, so obviously that it would make the money. It would be great for yeah. them, but you know, I don't know. Uh, I I'll be interested either way, but I think Divinity Three makes the most sense for them uh, as far as a profit standpoint. Yeah, absolutely cool. So continuing on with Baldur's Gate Three. Sorry, back to what you've been yeah, playing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, yeah. So Baldur's Gate Three. Been playing that on off nights when we don't get to play um, our D and D campaign, which has been a ton of fun. Um, I'm still. Playing Vampire Survivors. <laughs> I don't know why, but like when I'm in a funk, I'm like, okay, I know that I can pick up Vampire Survivors in 30 minutes with a flash before my eyes. And that's the same case. And now that they have adventures, uh, adventure mode in the game, it's fun to jump into that. So I'm playing the Among Us DLC adventure mode, uh, which is actually quite funny and fun. So I've been enjoying that. My son really has this fascination with among us so he does like to watch uh and speaking of vampire survivors i'm also playing deep rock galactic survivor um mainly almost well exclusively on my steam deck it's essentially vampire survivors in the world of deep rock galactic which is a game i have not played but i'm familiar with which is mining dwarves to get resources and that's where the Vampire Survivors clone takes off. The differences between that and Vampire Survivors is you get way less frequent upgrades. And there are guns. And you can also mine through rocks to kind of divert enemies. Like They'll still try to come towards you the closest way possible. But if you're in the middle of a rock structure, they kind of have to decide which direction they're going to go. So you can kind of skirt them a little bit. Yeah. Um, but the maps have a shuttle you have to get back to after you complete an objective, and it's timed. So if you don't make it back, you lose. Also, uh, there's boss fights uh, after I think it's maybe level wave three or four or level three or four uh, in the game. It's also very fun and just you know one of those quick uh, like I was watching TV and playing it until my Steam Deck battery died. So, gotcha. Uh, it's addicting and fun in in quick matches. 
Yeah, I was I say you might really enjoy because I've played regular Deep Rock Galactic, and it's a fun time. And it gets very hectic when all of a sudden you you know finish your thing, and then you have like ninety seconds to get out. And you're like, oh crap! Oh. Like I'm gonna <laughs> try to run out of here. Bugs are coming everywhere. It's a good time. So and Survivor looks like a a great time too. I just wish it wasn't only on PC. Yeah, yeah. Which I know is early access right now, right? I believe it is. Yeah. Yes. Oh, so that's fun. Yes, those that's boom, boom, boom. Also speaking to PC and the gaming group, where we have been previously playing uh, Phasmophobia and then Lethal Company. So the natural reverse progression for us is Escape the Back Rooms because we play old <laughs> games. Uh, so I did. Uh, I was gifted Escape the Back Rooms from uh, Kevin Austin, and uh, I played with Kevin and his son. Um, and it was it was it was a ton of fun. It's uh more puzzly than the other games. It's like more puzzle focused than uh, Phasmophobia, but very similar feel. Um, just kind of like you know those the, those games are great because it's you're like you're very social, and you can have fun and make jokes and laugh and and kind of give each other crap when you when someone makes a mistake. So those are a lot of fun. Uh, I'm really enjoying those. Uh, since we last recorded, my son has had a birthday, uh, for his birthday this year, he got an Xbox series S. Wow. Uh, so, so now, that's the one they sold that month. Okay. Yeah. I'm that sorry. one. I'm yeah. <laughs> uh, so now he doesn't dominate the TV in the living room as much, but also the nice thing is, um, because we gave, gave him game pass as well. We can now play games together. Nice. Um, with, you know, that we couldn't necessarily, play split screen Mm -hmm. so we have been playing hot wheels unleashed 2 together because i just hit game pass the past week yeah he really liked the first one so um it's just been a ton of fun playing with my son like that's a very cool experience to have and uh, the game is good the game is good i really like the first hot wheels unleashed so Mm -hmm. uh, they really followed up with some uh uh, new tweaks and upgrades and the maps are fun and challenging. Um, but it's just nice to be able to like sit and play a race against or, or like there's different modes and stuff too you can play. Um, so that's been a ton of fun. Uh, speaking of uh, Xbox, this uh, there is a carton sale going on on the Xbox. There's actually a ton of Lego games on sale. So my son just started playing Lego City Undercover on my Xbox because I already owned it. Um, but I went to add it to his Xbox and they wanted to charge him 30 bucks. So I was like, well, I guess you could just dominate the <laughs> TV in the living room again. <laughs> right. Uh, so he's been playing that in the living room, but um, I grabbed. So there's a Lego sale. There's a buy one, get three free on Xbox right now. Jeez. Okay. Uh, and then there's also a regular sale. So the buy one, get three free, you're paying regular price. Oh, okay. So some of those games are still 60 bucks, but there's also a current sale right now. And most of the Lego games are six bucks. So he got Lego worlds and Lego Marvel superheroes. So he's, he has those on his Xbox now too. And he's been spending a lot of time at Lego worlds, which has been a lot of fun. Um, and I got there from hot wheels unleashed too. And we'll also mention part of that sale that I was talking about where the Legos were is the, I, as an Easter sale, spring sale, whatever Xbox has going on. Yeah. They get a bunch of games on sale. Finally, Dead or Alive 6 was at a price I was willing to pay for, uh, which I don't know if that makes me like a hypocrite because I really like the game and I've always liked Dead <laughs> or Alive. But it's always kind of been that like that fighting game. It's that one, you know? Right. Uh, and I always forget how good the controls are and how good the it's kind of basic um as far as the fighting goes but it's still fun it's a really nice loop um it doesn't make it hard to do combos it doesn't make it hard to do grapples uh so if you've ever played like soul caliber or virtual fighter or the dead or alive games it takes place in that like 3d battle arena so you do have three di- three dimensional movement for dodging attacks and things Um, But the attacks are very simple. There's punch, there's kick, there's guard, and there's super. And that's it. You know, kind of like what Street Fighter VI tried to do by making the the controls, like, generic or easy for newbies that are alive definitely has that feel. 
Gotcha. Um, for anyone who's worried, the physics are still firmly or are not so firmly in place for Dead or Alive 6, uh, which is always a big <laughs> thrill for people. Uh, but I, ge- I do genuinely like the combat in the game. So uh, the levels are really cool. The controls feel really nice. Um, and I think it was like 16 bucks to get the deluxe edition. So it was a steal. Uh, that for a like good an deal. $80 value. So I was happy to jump on that. Uh, let's see. Okay. I did play a board game <laughs> in between. Nice work. I have not. Time. So, yes. <laughs> but it is a board game we've talked at length about in the past. Uh, that is Wingspan. So, my buddy, he backed a board game table. He just got it in. So, he Ooh. set it up. Uh, we went over to play. We had a game night, and he also had never played Wingspan fully. He played like half of a game once. So we opened his new copy of Wingspan. He got for Christmas. We played. Uh, and man, I just like forget how enjoyable that game is in person. Like I played it a lot on the apps and it is still great on the Xbox or the PC, but really to get those textured cards in your hand and roll those dice in the bird feeder and kind of move it around the board, placing birds. Mm-hmm. Uh, I really just solidifies how much I like that game. Uh, so it was just a really fun experience. We had a full full game going, so we had all of the boards taken. Uh, awesome. It was a lot of fun. I really enjoyed it. And last but certainly not least, uh, Helldivers 2. If I'm playing games, uh, that is the game I'm trying to play, at least mm-hmm. the most. Um, it still is rough trying to play solo. And yeah. it's not the game's fault. That's just the game wasn't designed to be played solo, I don't think. Um, but it is an option to do. So sometimes I'll jump in just if I have like the need to get in and kill some bugs. Um, but it's best played with friends. So when I can play with friends, I do. And uh, man, it's just like, it's. <laughs> I don't see this not being in my top five. Right. I, I know it's early in the year. <clears throat> but they really figured it out, right? They really, they really figured out how to make a uh, fun, addicting game that respects your time and also humbles you while you're playing and tells <laughs> you your time is worth nothing uh, at the same time. So I really appreciate that about the game, and, and I think it's re- it's balanced well enough that if I miss like a week, I can still jump in and feel like the game is the same. So I do enjoy that aspect as well. Um, and that's uh, everything I've been playing. Gotcha. Uh, yeah, I, I am very like disappointed in myself that I, I still have not started playing Helldivers 2. Wow. Um, I know it's, <laughs> well, you're it's, busy. It's, <laughs> I, ha- I have been. And it's, it's been tough because I know, obviously, like you, like you said, you can play the game by yourself. But I'm like, well... I only have like 30 minutes. Do I really yeah, want to jump in? You need an hour. Right. Least, you know, mission. and that's, and that's been the tough thing about it. So, uh, it is on the list. It is something I definitely want to dive in, dive, dive into. <laughs> um, I've been trying to convince, um, my, and I, even, I haven't even playing, been playing much overwatch even, but I've been trying to convince my overwatch peeps to, to transition. And I just, just can't do it. They're not real willing to. So, you know, here I sit, being all sad. And obviously, I want to play with you all, but I just play games so much later than you guys yeah. do. So <laughs> um, you're all, you know, responsible adults in bed. And I'm like, time to start gaming. <laughs> so that makes Yeah, I've been in bed by eight o'clock at least three nights in the past seven. <laughs> yeah. And that, yeah. Yep. And I'm usually starting gaming at like 10 30. Yeah. So, <laughs> yeah. But okay. Well, Josh. Uh, I have a whole bunch of games to talk about, uh, yeah. most of them very, very quickly. Um, so one thing, though, that has been good, and as partly that has cut into my time for gaming and other things, is I have, well, in some ways, in some ways not, um, I have been really committed that I'm like, okay, I'm going to start working out again. And I have been. So I've been using the elliptical basically every day for 40, 45 minutes, like to, you know, make sure that I'm moving my body and doing the stuff I need to and, you know, doing some push-ups and sit-ups and all that fun stuff. But as part of this, one of the things that I have discovered that actually works really, really well is using my PlayStation Portal on oh, nice. while I'm doing it. And because uh, I, I didn't know if this was going to work, because I'm like, well, it's an elliptical, but I'm able to like set my arms like kind of on the handles, okay, so that like I'm able to like still play games like while I'm moving <laughs> my body and doing my thing. Uh, so I was like, okay, let me see how this is going to go. 
So I started with like a group of what I thought would be uh, the perfect games to play while on this. Because I was like, what's going to be easy? Card games. Card games are going to be the things that are going to be super simple. I can totally do this. And that's what I started with. And three card games, one of which I know you love. Um, so I downloaded or I put on my PlayStation 5. I have Inscription, Bellatro, yeah. and Rogue Book. Um, so those are the games that I have been kind of like rotating through up until recently, which I'll talk about in a second. But I just kind of have every day, like just jump into one of those three games um, while I'm on the ellipt- elliptical. Now, Bellatro, we've obviously talked about previously. You know, the deck building poker ba- hand based game. Uh, I still really enjoy this game. Like right now, I think, you know, obviously the year is has a ways to go. And you talked about how for you, you don't see how Helldivers is in, in your top five. I don't see how Bellatro is not in my top 10. I wouldn't say top five necessarily, but this is just a game that I really enjoy. The one thing that is my biggest knock on it would be that some runs can take me the full 45 minutes and other runs take me like four minutes. Yeah. Um, and that's the only thing that's like a little bum, a bit of a bummer of it is because of the rogue nature of it um, and the impact that the jokers have because the jokers that you get like modify, yeah, you know, how many points you get for flushes or the like kind of the way that things trigger, they adjust your multipliers, like all this good stuff. Like if you don't get good jokers right away or if you don't get good pulls, like while you're in that in that run you can kind of tell usually like within your first like ante of your first small blind big blind boss like this is going to be a good run or it's not like you can typically tell um so that's kind of the one knock against the game for me is that there are hu- at least for me and maybe there's a skill thing i don't know there are huge swings between like good runs and not good runs and it's not even re- remotely close the, the difference between them um, but I'm still enjoying it. Uh, obviously, Inscription, a game that came out a few years ago, a game I know you enjoy greatly, a game I had yeah. started but never finished. Uh, so I was like, well, you know, what, what the heck? Let's jump back into this and, and start playing it. I basically have gotten to where I was before, oh, which okay. I know is before kind of like the first change, twist, whatever happens at the game. Okay. And I don't right. exactly know what that is yet, but I do know that I'm like I, roughly right there, I believe. So, uh inscription kind of a again a roguelike deck builder where you're kind of doing some card battling that's how the game starts we'll see what happens as we continue because i've been told that maybe things get a little maybe different it anyway, continue maybe it doesn't there. i don't know we'll see <laughs> um so it is a really good game though it, it's kind of one of those it's very it oozes personality like it really has a, a game design sense that it sticks to very intently um and kind of a sense of place that it creates so it's really good though, um, and it's actually on. I don't know if it's on Game Pass. I'm guessing it's on Game Pass. I don't think it is. Okay, it is on PlayStation Plus, whatever version of PlayStation Plus I have. It's on that, so that's kind of how I was playing it. Um, and that also goes for Rogue Book, which was just added to PlayStation Plus recently. It's a little bit of an older game. Uh, it's another deck builder, though. Uh, I believe this was actually designed. Um, by garfield so the person who created magic i believe he had a hand in richard garfield had a hand in this game uh this is a deck building battler where you you know run into enemies and you have this deck of cards what's a little bit different about this game maybe compared to other deck builders though overall it's not that different uh is that in your cards your your characters are stacked like ones in the front and ones behind and then when you do some things it will adjust the order of your characters and your characters, depending on what order they're in might influence like who's going to get hit when and how, and for how much damage. So you are kind of wanting to think about like, while you're playing your cards, uh, who do I want to end up where, you know, like if I do this and they're going to jump back, is that good? Cause I want this other person up front. Uh, so that's one thing that's maybe slightly different is kind of how you stack your characters. Uh, and the other thing then is that between the, matches that you're playing you're it goes back to kind of a gridded open world that you then have a person a character that you can walk uh, walk around and as you get to hexes if you've won your previous match you get basically the ability to unlock additional hexes to walk on uh, so you're kind of like working your way through these maps with the events eventually trying to beat a boss then to take a portal to the next map and all the other trappings are there of you know um getting resources to upgrade cards or buy new cards or destroy cards that are a little weaker and like all of those things are there the different characters that are in the game have different like cards and abilities that they have so like which characters do you take when you're going out on your adventure depending on what you're trying to do so there's it's doing a lot of things that exist in other games but putting them trying to put them together into this its own game and i don't know that it does any of them better than any other game and i don't know that it is better 
than any game with by putting them all together if that makes sense so it's it's sure. fine i mean i'm not gonna stop playing it but it's also kind of of the three the one i am least interested in playing um anytime i jump on there so those have been the big three of inscription Bellatro, and rogue book um, that have taken most of my time you know on my quote-unquote workout block if you would uh in addition to that i you know have had this desire for a while like kind of really really wanting a you know when we talk about playstation remastering games and it's like seems like all they're doing these days rather than making new games they just remaster their old games <laughs> one thing that they have not remastered though which is really frustrating is the resistance trilogy and it would be really nice to get the resistance games playable uh, on playstation 5 that'd be great and they were like okay well we'll give you a resistance game that you can play on your playstation 5 and that's resistance retribution which came as part of playstation premium or whatever the high level one is that you know sometimes they put psp games (laughs) on your playstation yeah uh this is a resistance game that came out back in like 2009 for the psp or something like that i think from a time frame perspective i think it takes place between like resistance Fall of Man and Resistance 2, I think. I think it's right between the two. (sighs) I was like, well, I want to play a Resistance game, so I'll (laughs) put this up. Oh my gosh, Josh, this is so rough. (laughs) It's so, so so hard. Because, like, yeah, they make it so these games, quote unquote, work on PlayStation 5, but this is not an optimized experience. (laughs) Like, when you're still, like, shooting with, like, the R1 and L1 rather than the trigger, I mean, it's just... And, like, you can't really, like, you can aim, but you can't really aim because the PSP didn't have dual analogs, right? So, like, trying to aim, it's just so funny feeling, like, trying to play this game. And uh, the writing is not good. The voice acting exists, which I guess is good. Like, I guess that's (laughs) the thing. And, yes, I know this is a PSP game. I know this game is, like, 15 years old that was running on, you know, well, at the time it was powerful handheld, but now, like, very weak system, but. It is just gross looking and like, you know, like this is those moments when, you know, everyone made fun of Jim Ryan, who uh, is now done at PlayStation. I think he on Friday was his last day. <laughs> uh, you know, he's like, oh, old game is old. Who'd want to play that? Sometimes he's right. You know, <laughs> like, I, don't know. I was I, I really wanted to play this just because I, I wanted to get some resistance in my life again. And now I'm like, man, maybe I shouldn't have played this. But the other reason I wanted to play it is I thought the platinum wasn't going to be that challenging. And I don't think it is. But I don't know if I have it in me to stick it out just to get the platinum <laughs> is the problem. So sure. we'll see. Maybe I will play, continue to play this game. Maybe I won't. If you really want a resistance fix, I would say maybe skip this, actually. I don't know that it's going to give you that resistance <laughs> fix you're looking for. Maybe, you know, there'll be some cool crossover with Helldivers and you can fight the Hellgas and Helldivers. I think that would be a great option that instead. Could be cool. That would be cool. Uh, speaking of which, though, you had mentioned the, the Lego sale that's going on. There's PlayStation yeah. doing their spring sale as well. And not f- as part of that, but I was looking at getting, you know, kind of rounding up my lego cat game library because i have most of the lego games uh but in doing so i totally realized and forgot that i actually do own lego city undercover so the partner and i started playing it nice. uh and <laughs> you know it's it's interesting have you played lego city undercover i've only watched i haven't played it so wh- one of the things i find curious about this game is you know the lego games collecting studs pretty typical that's the thing that almost all the lego games have collect all of your studs get the red bricks to multiply so that way you can get your billion studs to get your trophies or or achievements and all this good stuff but lego city undercover does this interesting thing where in addition to collecting studs you also have to collect bricks and then you have to use these bricks to kind of have these like signature builds that you have to do you know throughout the town and you know lego city undercover an original story it's not based off an ip it's lego trying to tell the story of this police officer who like had you know arrested this famous criminal and now that criminal has gotten broken out and he's got to come back and try to get him uh and it's trying to do it with this typical you know lego humor and things like that most of the humor is not great but (laughs) i do applaud nonetheless of having a light-hearted game right i talk about and we talk about that so many games are trying to be so serious all the time and that for this game even though it's not maybe doing the best it could as far as being humorous, the fact that it is lighthearted, jovial, trying to go for jokes, uh, since that happens so rarely, I'll give it a pass as far as that goes. So uh, again, otherwise pretty unremarkable from a Lego game perspective. It's not doing anything super different. Otherwise the combat is what it is. You know, the fact that you are pretty much just 
switching between different versions of the same character all the time is a little different rather than having this slew of a you know 300 characters to unlock that have different abilities and skills you're just unlocking like police version criminal version <laughs> minor version like yeah. minor being like a person who minds not like someone who's under 18 <laughs> yeah um so yeah that's a, a bit different but other than that you know pretty unremarkable but if you like lego games and you're looking for another lego game to play with people um i think this is an easy recommend it's not gonna blow your mind but if you've enjoyed your past experiences you probably would enjoy this one as well nice so in addition like i said still rocking and rolling here um played some bigger playstation releases rise of the rodin came out just a few week about a week ago from when we we're recording this i have put a whole two hours into it go me um and it's good ish i will say that's about all i can say right now uh it, one thing that really oh that's kind of a spoiler so i don't want to say that they do a thing at the beginning of the game that bothered me a little bit because i committed more time to something than i should have only Was for character to... creation yeah <laughs> i did play this game a little bit i didn't want to know because i only played it for a little bit but yeah uh, maybe we had a different experience and i don't know why this struck me to be so odd because I thought it was very odd that we had the opportunity to customize our characters to the point where I was like, I don't want to even change a single part of their appearance. So I didn't change anything. You were lucky. I was, like, these are, <laughs> I was like, these are two characters they're telling us a story of, right? I'll feel weird changing their appearance because I don't have any, they're not me and right. I don't have any affiliation to them. So I was like, this is weird and uh, well, like, it's very bizarre to me. Yeah. So you're telling me you probably spent like an hour customizing the I mean, not a long characters. time, but, but had I known what was going to happen, longer time than sure. I would have <laughs> um, in doing it. So, but otherwise, yeah, it's, it's it's you know, all the things and all the reviews that are out there. Like, there are some things about it I like. There are some things that I don't. Uh, it. I'm interested to see where it goes and if this will keep my attention. I do want to play more of it, so it's not like I'm ignoring it. Uh, I just haven't had the time to play more of it. But so far, the combat has seemed interesting. I think there are a ton of upgrade. I mean, there's a lot of systems in this game. Yeah, it's very uh, yeah. systems heavy. So yeah. if that's something you're worried about, I don't know that you can get away from that with this game. It is very systems heavy. But I am at least we'll you know give a bigger update in April and we'll see if I continue to play it. But for now... Uh, I'm going to continue to play it, but I don't have much more to say than that. Uh, on the flip side of that, uh, the demo for Stellar Blade came out on Friday. <laughs> Stellar yeah. Blade, PlayStation game coming out at the end of April. Uh, I downloaded the demo. I played and completed the demo, and I then pre-ordered the game. So <laughs> there you go. That is, that, the demo it did its job. <laughs> yep, the demo did its job. Um, Josh got us a sexy game in Dead or Alive, so I was like, well, yes, I'll get us a sexy game in Stellar Blade. <laughs> uh, Stellar Blade is, though, you're very much... Some people have been saying that it is not as advertised, and I, I struggle with that because I feel like it very much is what is advertised. Uh, I guess, I guess, unless maybe you thought it was going to be a little more like Devil May Cry E Bayonetta E, it's not quite as fast as that. It is definitely more uh, a little bit slower, pretty challenging, uh, but it is you know a character action game where you have a sword and you are dodging and parrying and attacking and picking up different things and having special abilities and trying to navigate and understand the way the enemies are going to attack and being able to parry at the right times. I don't want to say it's necessarily a quote unquote souls like per se, but it is challenging, but I was playing it on quote unquote regular difficulty. I think I only died one time and it's because I did something stupid, uh, but it is overall, it feels pretty good. The gra I mean, <laughs> They're they're definitely going for something with the graphics of this game. Like there's yeah. a, they have a mission <laughs> on what they're trying to do, and overall, I think they direct, they do it pretty well. The graphics are pretty solid. The music choices I like kind of where the soundtrack is for this game as far as kind of how they're doing it. But overall, I enjoyed it. The only real nit I have to pick is that the distance you can dodge feels weird to me um and maybe that's something through unlocks down the road it'll be a bigger dodge or whatever it is but there's these one attacks that happen that for a while at least you cannot dodge you cannot counter them in any way and eventually you learn a way that you potentially can but if you want to like just get out of the way of certain of these attacks like you have to like dodge like three times in a row like it's not oh, like, really? just, like dodge like to get or or maybe i'm just trash at the game which yeah. is possible <laughs> this is a demo but sure. or i guess yeah like but because some of the core like okay Use your words, Kyle. 
some of the corridors were pretty tight that I was fighting some of these characters in, and they would have attacks that were going to come straight forward and the corridors weren't wide enough for me to like dodge to the side to get past it but if yeah. i just dodged straight behind i couldn't get far enough back to get away from it if that sure. makes sense yeah so it was like like i said maybe that was just i did i should have kited that enemy somewhere else and fought them in a more wide open area maybe you know maybe i should have get better at parrying you know like there's a lot of things that you could just say i need to do um i did i have been trying to focus on parrying because it does seem more powerful because you can counter and things like that if you do parry effectively uh but they do give you an option of kind of developing that for your dodge as well where if you dodge um and have a perfect dodge it gives you an opportunity to attack back so it seems like it's kind of open either play style but because of like i said the length of that dodge i feel like the parry might be the quote unquote better way to go as far as those things go but overall it was about a 60 to 90 minute i would guess demo uh and it, your progress does carry over to the main game if you wanted to because it is just starts from the very beginning of the game nice so yeah i, I enjoyed it so in addition to all of these things josh yeah I have, there's, there's three other things game. on here <laughs> what's that so yeah there's some other things on here there are some other things in here so josh obviously Big game came out in February, that uh, Final Fantasy VII Rebirth game. Yeah. Uh, I I downloaded it. I, I haven't even started it yet. <laughs> <laughs> it literally is just sitting there staring at me. And I was like, okay, I'm totally going to play this thing. It's going to be awesome. I'm going to sit down. I'm going to I'm gonna play this game. And it, it just yeah. hasn't happened. Um, it, it Like I said, I've been busy. And I don't feel like I really want to sit down and play this for like 30 minutes, right? Like, and just try to get into it. It it does seem like this is going to be something that's going to, at least my initial sit down, I probably would want to be more like three hours. Sure. And that just isn't happening right now. So we'll see. I'm looking forward to playing it still. I want to play it. It is on my cross media bar, just waiting to be played. um, But it is not anything that I have played. But part of the reason, though, in addition to that, that I didn't play it, um, is... This is where my surprise that I'm springing on you, Josh. One of the things I decided, because I, I mentioned like a month or two ago about like, hey, we should do like our top 10 games of all time. Thing, sure. Right. Here's what I realized, though, Josh. I don't know what my top 10 games of all time are anymore at all. OK, that's that's not unreasonable. So I decided that this is going to be the year 2024. That's what year we're in. Yeah. Uh, I'm going to figure out my top 10 games. So I've been going back which is a thing I rarely do and playing games that I think might make it out really? to the list to see what's going on. And I think this first, you know, kind of group of games that I'm playing, it's more of like, I think to, I'm replaying these games to see if they will ever get on here. Cause it's a series that I always say I like, but then I'm like, do I really like the series or do I not? And that is gears of war. So I played oh. gears of war one and I'm halfway through gears of war two. Um, so I played Gears of War Ultimate Edition, and then yeah, and Gears of War Two, which odd that you know Gears of War One was remastered, Gears of War Two was not. Uh, and I will say, I know that the fact that you can play Gears of War Two through on your Xbox is amazing. Yeah, I haven't played a 360 game on my Xbox <laughs> in a really long time, so actually getting signed in for it to work was a pain yeah. in the but yeah yeah but now since i got in it's been fine but that initial like getting into that oh my goodness gracious <laughs> it was like it was like being like your password isn't correct i'm like no my password is correct like this is the right password it was like and so i was like looking on an online forum so like oh yeah you gotta like restart this thing and do this thing and do this other thing and i was like oh my lord but i finally like got it. in <laughs> i finally got in um for and that was obviously for years of war two but yeah years of war one great experience gears of war 2 solid experience so far things though just generally because I, I obviously these games are old like most people know about them and and kind of who you're playing as and the, and the story and all that good stuff yeah but what has been interesting to me in playing these is these were the quote-unquote triple a games of their day right like these were the games that were as triple a as any game was when they came out in the late 2000s um and it's amazing to me they look good still. Even two, which isn't remastered, still looks pretty darn good for how yeah. old it is. But the stuff that we would absolutely decimate games for today that are just happening everywhere in these games is like really like your companions, like because obviously you're always are dumb. Oh, yeah, they are awful. so stupid. Yeah. And like just running into like bullet fire and just dying yeah. and literally times where they're like just rolling back and forth like over block and there's no enemies 
They're just yeah. rolling back and forth, like, over these blocks <laughs> for the fun of it, apparently. And, like, there are times where I'm like, I don't even know where you are, Dom. Like, you're, like, nowhere. Like, I hit the little button to, like, see where he is. And he's, like, yeah. way, way. Like, I was like, I left that room, like, 10 minutes ago. Like, why are you, like, <laughs> nine rooms behind me, dude? Like, what is yeah. going on? Just, it's so fascinating that this was, like, the cream of the crop in the, back in the day. Yeah. And today, if that happened, people would absolutely, like, rip that apart. Yeah. But with that yeah. all being said, none of that affected my enjoyment of the game at all. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's not a great time, right? Like, because, you know, your dude's shooting stuff. What I was surprised by was how quickly they just, like, get you into the story. And they're like, ah, you'll figure it out. It's fine. Right, it's right, just, yeah. you know, yeah. like, there's a little brief overview of what happened. And then suddenly you're like, well, all right, I have this guy and I'm shooting these things. <laughs> so we're going to go get this thing and hammer Dom, point that at that thing. Sure. You and, just need to know emergency. That's it. That's right. The that's end. all you need to know, right? <laughs> and that you're fighting these things. And that's all you need to know. Um because I, I've always said I really like Gears of War. I love the active reload. I think that's one of those me- mechanisms that I'm so shocked does not come to other games, um, or is very rarely comes. It's to in other a games. couple, it's, but not a lot. Yeah, yeah. It's just such a cool thing, and it like keeps you engaged, and it makes you thinking about like, okay, knowing I'm going to get a damage boost, like how am I going to use this? Is it better that since that enemy is dead, and I know that more are going to come, do I just reload even though I'm nowhere near empty to get that little boost? It's just such a fun little neat thing that they kind of add on top, which makes everything a little more high stakes because when you mess it up you're like well shoot he's now i'm just not going to shoot anything for a second here (laughs) the only thing i still i don't really like is throwing grenades in that game i never liked it i feel like throwing grenades is kind of weird and you have to like open yourself up quite a bit to like throw it the way where you want it to be um but i was pretty stoked to find out that the bug on the boss in the final boss in the first game is still there so that's great (laughs) so you can beat him really easily um but that's still there so yeah i gears of war one down gears of war two about halfway through uh at least gonna go through three i think maybe judgment we'll see what happens but like i said just seeing if any of these games um kind of really want to get in there um or or vie for that top 10 favorite games of all time because like i said the series is one that i always go back to of like really enjoying um and then on top of that i downloaded but i have not played yet another game that i often call one of my favorites and that's what remains of edith finch so that i have downloaded so i plan to play that before we podcast again um, so that those are kind of some fun things I've been doing as I try to. So, Josh, here's my question for you. Yeah. Do you want to commit to our November episode this year? Top 10 games of all time. Sure. Of all time. OK, yeah. that way, if you want to play things, you can. If you don't want to, that's fine. <clears throat> um, but I, this, but I, I really I don't know. I just feel like if I'm going to do this, I'm going to commit to like I'm going to play some of these things. Do they still really feel that way? Um, do I do I really have a good top 10 list basically yeah i'll have to think about it um because i know a lot of my a lot of my top five games i have played recently but i think i have always i'm always playing them recently to a degree yeah. whether it's full year or partially so um yeah i'm game for that that sounds like fun yeah because part of me too is I have like some pretty old games that I always talk about as being my favorite, but are yeah. they really still, you know, like I don't necessarily want to have like a super modern list either just because of the things I played recently. But even going back to, like I said, Gears of War, which again, really enjoying it, just seeing some of the stuff. I'm like, man, what we used to put up with and just not yeah. even think about <laughs> or care about. It's just so, it's so bizarre. Uh, and then the final game, that's a surprise game. And I, I hope this makes you happy, Josh. Oh, um, I hope so too. It, what a it, lead. This, what's that? What a lead. Uh, is a game that I know you really, really like. And it's a game that I have always meant to play and just never got around to it. But now, okay. and I know you, and you even bought it for us. Board, oh, so video game. Yep, it was a video game. So, and you even bought it for us. And I, I never played it, but it just recently got added to play at one of the PlayStation services. Oh, you're going to make me so happy. And you're going to tell me, I don't even care if you like it. I'm just going to be happy that you're playing it. Yeah, and because of that, for my now, and since it is card driven, uh, it seems very perfect to play while I'm working out. Yeah. Uh, so yes, I have started playing Marvel's Midnight Suns. Hell yeah! <laughs> and I will say, Josh, I'm I'm only I'm very early. Like I literally have done like the inch. Well, I created my character, went and did the first battle that you do with Blade and Doctor Strange at the, and you know you fight Venom and all that good stuff. That's it. So, so I'm not very far into it. Uh, there's. I know you said there's a lot of story in this game. There's a lot of story in this game. There's like, so what, much story in this game. Uh, but I'm really liking it. This is. I'm having a really yeah. great time with it. This uh, is. Uh, it's really good so far. Obviously, I'm very early. Um, but you know, 
by inscription Bellacho and Rogue book, I'm going to be taking a seat for a while, I think, because um, this is definitely where I think I'm, the bulk of my time Great. is going to go. I'm working out moving forward. So um, really excited because, like I said, it's just one of those things that is now I have a convenient way to play it. Um, so I, I'm looking forward to doing that. But I, I've been surprised at how much I like the the battle system. I didn't really – never really been a huge tactics person. Sure. And this is just enough, like – some planning, but some card play and like thinking about how you use like your discards and your movement, and which is limited, but there and how you use your objects in the environment and how you yeah. get kind of like, you know, your ability to kind of get those charges. So you can use those things, just kind of like putting all that stuff together. It's been really fun so far. So I am a little daunted at probably eventually the number of cards that are going to exist, the number of characters that are going to exist, like trying to make the perfect teams and all that good stuff. But so far, I'm interested. It's fun. Uh, I'm really happy I actually played Marvel Snap before I played this because oh, I'm sure. like, hey, I know who all these characters are now yeah. because of Marvel <laughs> Snap. So, yeah, but overall, Marvel's been nice on so far. Man, I, I get the people who love it. I get why they love it. And I understand, like, also being so bummed that this game was not more successful because it's, again, I'm only a couple hours in, but I'm, I'm really enjoying it so far. So that is everything I've been playing as we're now, you know, 50 minutes into the show. So no big deal. So, but hey, I'm excited. We're going to figure out our top 10 games of all time. I'm surprised that you're like, I know my top five and I play them all the time. Because like, I don't even know my top five anymore. Well, I, I shouldn't say I play them all the time, but I have all, I have played them all recently. I, I do wonder, I, I haven't played my number one in a while, like fully, all over what, again. Right now, what would you say your favorite game of all time is? It's Horizon Zero Dawn is my number okay. one. So I'm That's very curious to see if that stays there see and my problem is my number one i have always said is chrono trigger <laughs> yeah. so that's not gonna change <laughs> it might, i mean i don't know the game play itself isn't gonna change <laughs> yeah I, I know and that's the thing is like i know and i know i can play that on pc in other places so i'm gonna have to you know make that happen but yeah that's kind of my thing is like you know games that i put on there too is like one of the other games i often put in my top 10 is like ssx tricky I don't know. I mean, I remember it being fun. <laughs> was a, it because that's of the, the music? Catch, right? Yeah. yeah. But, it, but also, should you have to... That's the tough part, right? Because like your memory of it can still keep it in your top 10, but you're not going to play it and play a PlayStation 2 game right now that plays good. <laughs> or, like, There's no way. Those games don't hold up. It just doesn't hold up now. Uh, so you can look back at games like trying to think of like even like a great like even metal gear solid right so I, I just bought that collection yeah and i'm very interested to see what happens when i go back to play metal gear solid again for the first time so this will actually be a great excuse <laughs> to play the these three games again um because i i i just don't think thinking about how groundbreaking metal gear solid was with the rain and the coming into the boat and the sneaking like that was groundbreaking. It was like the Matrix for video games, what they were for movies. Like you had never been able to play a game in that type of environment before. And now I just keep thinking, I wonder if it's going to be tedious to play through this game. Because <laughs> <laughs> obviously that's going to sour the the memory of that. So sometimes I think it is dangerous to to go back and kind of alter your memory of the perfect game at that yeah. at that time in your life but it, also though i think of you know when i listen to other people talk about their favorite games of all time they talk about games that they replay all the time right and i do wonder if i, I the ps2 generation is the thing that i wonder most about almost of you know like i mentioned for gears going back there were the things that would probably annoy me if it was a modern game today and had those issues i find charming because i'm like oh i remember when i played this, right. and this is, you know right <laughs> yeah. so I, I am wondering if for something like ssx tricky right like would i just find it nostalgically charming about the things that if i was picking up for the first time would annoy me you know so uh, would i be like oh i remember this is what I had to do to like make this work out because the, the controls were like what I thought they did. Cause the, where I really remember that happening was when they did the Tony Hawk one, and two remasters. Yes. Like I always liked Tony Hawk, but when yeah. I, when I played those remasters, I'm like, Oh man, I forgot about these controls. Like they get, they are awful. pretty annoying at the yeah, start. They're awful. <laughs> yeah. You know, so getting used to that again. And that's kind of what I wonder of because I have the love for tricky. Would I, overlook it whereas tony hawk i always liked but it was never a, you know a top 10 for me whereas i went back and was like ooh, 
brutal. Man, I was probably was better at video games back in the day. I don't know. So we'll see. I just think it's going to be fun to kind of revisit some of these things a little bit. And I, I do really want to think about, you know, some of my favorite games of the last recent years. Like I, right now, like one of the games that jumps to mind, it's like, where would would control be in like my top 10? And if so, yeah, where would it be? Because right, like, right. I love that game, right? So that's kind of, I, I want to figure that out. I just feel like it might be a fun project and hopefully not make me, you know, so focused on playing the newest, latest, best, as you know, I just talked about, you know, having Final Fantasy VII Rebirth, Rise of the Rodin, and Stellar Blade, like all queued up on my system. But there yeah, I'm not going to play the newest, latest, best. I'm going to, you know, play those old games. It's going to be great. Yeah. <laughs> so, all right, Josh, let's jump into the news and other topics. And uh, anything in the board game world that you'd like to talk about from this very, very lengthy list of things? Sure. Well, why don't we start with uh, talking about our favorite games of all time? Uh, why don't we talk about um, Eric Lang taking on Mass Effect for Modifius Entertainment? Maybe that's the only part of that sentence I'm not thrilled about is the end of that <laughs> sentence. Yeah. Uh, so Modifius has announced Mass Effect, the board game uh, titled uh, Priority Hegelaz, uh, which will be a tabletop version of uh, Mass Effect 3 uh, to narrow it down to games. Um, it will apparently be a, a story-driven uh, cooperative game that follows Shepard and the crew of the Normandy on a mission against the Reapers uh, with their ultimate goal to activate an alien superweapon called the Crucible to defeat Reapers before they overwhelm the galaxy. Uh, the game will feature a branch and narrative campaign that uh, responds to players' choices and is designed to allow replayability. Uh, the players will work together selecting squad members and gear drawn from the Mass Effect trilogy in a card-driven, it says AI, that controls the opposing forces. So thinking like when you buy these games from like Stonemaier Games and things like that where they have uh, AI decks for solo play, this will be acting kind of like the house in House at Haunted Hill. Uh, No, sorry. In Mansions of Madness or when they released the app-driven version of it. Right. Uh, you you could choose to not have a player play as the house. So it sounds like that'll be similar to this. Um, it's going to include uh, some uh, pre-assembled 32 millimeter plastic miniatures uh, that include the characters from Mass Effect, including both fa- uh, male and female versions of Shepard. We also have Liara. Uh, they wrote Tail, but I think they meant Tali. Uh, Rex <laughs> and Garrus. Uh, it's intended for one to four players, ages 14 and up. Each story campaign will include three to five chapters, uh, with each chapter taking about an hour to play. Uh, I really am excited, potentially, as long as this isn't a $300 Kickstarter or something. Uh, It doesn't say that it's going to be a Kickstarter, but who knows? It is Modifius, so I would expect it would have crowdfunding. Um, But I know I have a group of friends who love Mass Effect, so that means at least... I get some motivation to get it to the table instead of just sitting on the shelf as a collector's item. Uh, so I'd be really excited to see uh, what this game is going to look like. What are they thinking about for maps? Um, are we talking like the standard Kickstarters miniatures games, or are we going to see something maybe a little bit more interesting? So uh, I'm excited. Uh, and it's Eric Lang. So um, he is, if not anything, he's an interesting designer. So I'm sure it'll be something uh, kind of unique to what we've seen before. So I'll be excited to see that. How about you? I know that I don't know that you're as big of a Mass Effect fan as I am, but I know that you are a Mass Effect fan, correct? Oh, yeah, I'm definitely a Mass Effect fan. My question for you, Josh, is you remember back in the day, right prior to... um, Mass Effect Andromeda coming out. Oh, God, you're going to bring this up? <laughs> yeah. Don't I bring am. it up. Don't do it. <laughs> uh, you, you made a, a certain assertion about uh-huh. that game. Yes. Uh, that, you know, Mass Effect Andromeda would be <laughs> game of the year. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. Be, it would be one of the best games we'd ever play. Yeah. Um, yeah. How, <laughs> Can you believe we've been podcasting that long? <laughs> I know, right? <laughs> how, what, what are your feelings on... This board game, is this going to be the best board game ever made? Well, I'll say this, I guess. I'll say this about this board game. There is no way... Here, here's another big, giant, <laughs> sweeping statement. Yeah. There is no way 
in the world, in a million multiverses, that this game could ever let me down as much as Mass Effect Andromeda did. Okay. It's not a, a possibility. <laughs> gotcha. Now, unless I, I should take that back. Unless it became uh, sentient and then hunted me down and killed me. Then I probably feel like pretty like <laughs> gotcha. okay. just more disappointed. But other than that, or yeah. Uh, or like a truck full of the board games fell over uh, on a bridge and landed on top of my wife's car. That would also be terrible. Uh, but I can't otherwise... Besides death or dismemberment, I can't imagine this game would. <laughs> it could gotcha. be any worse or more disappointing. Okay. So I am I am wondering, though, that since this game, yes, it's being designed. Well, okay, this is where I always get a little confused. So it's a Modifius board game, but it's being published through Amazon or Asmodee. So, does that, so it probably won't have a Kickstarter then. It probably will just be pre-order, right? <laughs> Uh, maybe. I mean, I also, uh, man. Yeah. I don't know. Um, uh, I'm so skeptical about pre-orders now since I have, since Metal Gear Solid, the board game has gone radio silent. Oh yeah. And I was supposed to get the game two months ago, (laughs) three months ago. Yeah. (laughs) And I haven't heard a peep of uh, the money they took from me. (laughs) Well, I thought it was coming I thought it was supposed to be in like May this year. I think it was January originally or February. Oh, was it? Okay. Yeah. I don't know why I thought that in my head. Yeah, maybe they changed it now. I, I have got. I'm just good. They've gotten radio sound. So oh, maybe March. So I don't hopefully, remember. it's not anyway. the same as that. <laughs> yeah. Um, how much? What is the sweet spot for price for this for you? And what is like the? Ooh, I don't know if I would get it. Price for you? Sweet spots fifty nine fifty bucks fifty to sixty bucks right? Uh, I expect it to be. Uh, if it's like a Modifius game, like 100 to 120, yeah, uh, which I don't want it to be that much, but uh, I think I think like 100 bucks is my limit, uh, unless like without any information, right? Right. Uh, if they come out with something that looks incredible, uh, I'm not saying no, but uh, I can't. Even though I love Mass Effect, I can't just because it's a Mass Effect property. It uh, doesn't mean I need to own it because I also don't right. own Mass Effect, Risk, or Monopoly or whatever it came out like 10 years ago. Yeah. Well, I'm trying to think because when it comes to Modifius, um, and obviously, you know, they also – let me clarify by saying they do have like the their Agatha Christie game, which is like 20 bucks. Yeah. But um, Skyrim, I think the base game is like 150 <laughs> Yeah. And for Homeworld, I think – it's like to get both like the base box for and the fight fighter bundle or whatever the two things that you typically need. I think it's like two hundred, but like the base box is like a hundred and ten or something, you know. So yeah, it does seem I looked, they I looked at that go. Harry Potter Kickstarter. Yeah, and I really wanted to get it, but man, again, again, another miniatures game that just like is just sometimes I think it's just absurd to be absurd. Like they're like. We can make a fortune. Also, just get working on those models for the 3D printers. <laughs> like, <laughs> That's right. Okay. Three Harry Potters, three different versions. Great, great, great. But you have to get the third one. You got to pay an extra $60. <laughs> okay. Pass. <laughs> yeah. I do. So I do enjoy, like we said, I do enjoy Mass Effect. Um, I, I don't know. Again, it is one to four players. So I guess I could play this by myself. But I don't know that I would be able to justify this, unfortunately. Um, too many other games that I haven't been able to play yet. And just from a, yeah, from a um, getting it to the table standpoint, I, I think this would be pretty tough for me to get to the table. So. Sure, that makes sense. But we'll see, depending on the price, you know, I, I might be able to sneak it in there if it's, you know, if it is in that $50 range, it might be a possibility. Mm-hmm. But Cool. All right. Anything else about uh, the Mass Effect board game? Negative. Cool. Anything else you want to chat about then? Oh, boy. Uh, There's so many things. There's so many things, right? We can talk about Ascension, I guess, real quick. Um, I haven't really put too much time into looking into this because I just feel like I've already put so much time and money and effort into Ascension in the past. 
talking about like revisiting games. Um, yeah, Stoneblade Entertainment has announced that uh, Ascension Legends, which is a new standalone deck building game, uh, is it might be on GameFound now or it's coming to GameFound very soon. Um, and in this version of the game, you can take on the role of, uh, as before, the the Warriors of Vigil, and it's a deck building game. Uh, as classic as they come at this point, it's you know if you've started playing board games uh, in the renaissance of board games, you either play a Dominion or Ascension, right? Those yep. are the two the games that you played, and most likely you played both. Um, so it sounds like I don't have all the info here, but it sounds like they're just taking some of their best, in their opinion, cards from the long history of. Ascension and kind of throwing him into a cohesive deck because one of those things that also happened with Ascension was you'd get all the expansions and if you were like me, you mix them all together and then there's just too many cards and you're not ever getting to use the cards properly because their support cards are not available to you when you find them or at least the way they're best played. So. Um, uh, I, I think it's interesting if I was still collecting all of my Ascension stuff, I might grab it. If I think that I might be able to get my son into this in the future, maybe I'll still grab it and, you know, just keep it aside and only play that version. But, uh, I don't know. I don't know if I need. Do you have all the Ascension expansions still? Not, I have, I mean, I have every one I bought, but there was a point where I had to jump off. Right. Um, because there was just so many. But I, if I had to guess, I'd probably have uh, 80% of the expansions. I'm just wondering, like, what would it be like to, you know, try, try to play with the like, stack? The, mon- <laughs> the, the monster stack is like, like, this tall it's like 12 to 18 inches tall yeah that's so ridiculous and like we had to split them and keep them next to each other at one point when we were playing yeah um i did go to their i did they do their game found page is in preview so you can um see what you know what's coming from it um it is set to launch this summer it looks like so still oh, it's a not, bit okay. away yeah okay. it sounds like um apparently there are many people who are upset uh, because it says that the, um, it seems like many of us want to know what's up with the Year 7 Collector's Tins. Do you know what that is? Oh, it's a Collector's Tins, yeah. Yeah, it says, I have no interest in standalone games, just the full t- the full foil tin sets. If you're not going to keep the Collector's Tin sets going to keep my sets the same, all foil, um, that, <laughs> that our roads together might end here. So basically, oh, have geez. they done like full foils for like all their sets? Yeah, they put out $100, $100, dollars sets of the first few years. Um, so apparently they are up to six based off that comment, <laughs> but I was like a hundred dollars for a $40 game. I can't, I can't justify that. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> when I already the- have the version of the game anyways, like, <laughs> um, it says, I will not back this. If there is no year seven collectors tins, I see no reason to buy an expansion twice. And my set is a hundred percent foil. So I do not want to mix regulars. With there the you go. Piece. There they are. The people oh. are there. <laughs> I get it. Uh, I get it. Yeah. There's and there's multiple questions about that, like in this little in their uh, in the comment section. People wanting to know. People want to know about them foils, those shinies. But this game isn't for those people. This game is for new people to Ascension. Yeah. I would argue. Yeah. But I get In- it. Interesting. So they do have a few, you know, revealed cards and things like that, but nothing, no indication of price or anything like that, obviously, yet. It just says summer release, no specific, or summer launch, no specific date yet. Uh, Ascension is a game I definitely played. I played quite a bit of Ascension, but only had, like, the first couple expansions for it and just kind of fell off uh, because it does do the thing that you talked about that these games do. They just keep adding more and more and more and more content. And eventually you feel like you got to draw the line in the sand. And once you do that, it almost feels like you just can't participate anymore, which is weird, right? It's well, it's hard to be part of the meta at that point. Right. So yeah, you say you play Ascension and someone it's like magic, right? You say like, Oh yeah, I play magic. And then someone's like, what, what do you think about the new planeswalkers? And I'm, I don't know what a planeswalker is. I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm playing old magic. <laughs> right. Yeah. So it'll be interesting to see kind of how that does. Um, awesome. Any other board game things that jump out to you, sir? 
how about you, sir? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Well, I'm going to talk about, you know, all the really sad things uh, because that's just oh, like yeah. what I, I like to do. Avoid this. <laughs> oh, yeah, I'm going to go for it. Okay, Josh. So starting number one, yeah. uh, Funko. Uh, they had well, a every year they have a bad year just before yeah, you but they had, that's true they're they <laughs> funko is the uh gamestop of board games i feel yes, like they are. um so uh funko had a really tough 2023 uh josh they lost 154 million dollars in 2023 with on a 17 percent decline in sales okay, um, so I would so love, is, if they could lose one of those millions to me i would be happy right right it's just one <laughs> just one, just one of those millions. Uh, so this is from the folks over at ICV2 that Funko Inc. reported a 154.1 million full year loss for 2023 on a 70% sales decline to 1.1 billion from 1.3 billion in 2022, a much worse result than the 8 million loss in 2022. So basically, they lost $8 million in 2022 and then $154 million. In they 20 still 20 made $1.1 billion. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's crazy. Um, Fourth quarter Funko sales were down 13% to $291 million from $333 million in the year ago quarter. U.S. sales were down 18%, a 16.3% increase in sales in Europe, partially offset the decline in the U.S. and other international markets. The quarterly loss was $10.8 million, an improvement from the $42.2 million loss in Q4 2022. Jesus. Interim CEO Michael Lunsford attributed the bulk of Funko sales decline to, quote, one particular wholesaler, end quote. Um. <laughs> um, okay. Uh, but anyway, Lunsford, who was brought in to, uh, as a turnaround specialist, touted the company's efforts to reduce inventory, which was down $127 million, over 50% from the end of 2022, uh, to cut the size of Funko's workforce, um, which they have laid off a hold of people and to exit unprofitable lines and SKUs, um, which they have reduced their products by over 30%. Um, a move that ultimately resulted in the sale of its games division assets earlier this year. We talked about that earlier when Goliath acquired Funko's game assets. Um, and a group of Funko games alumni have since formed a new design and development studio called Te Tempest Workshop, which we'll see if we cover that story. We got it on here. Who knows? Uh, in 2024, Funko is concentrating on its direct-to-consumer sales, an area we control and can grow profitably. As I put it, direct-to-consumer sales were 20%, 26% of sales in Q4 and were up 30% from Q4 2022. Um, sales in 2024 are expected to be flat to down with an increasing percentage made direct-to-customers. So they are going to more do more sales direct-to-customers that they make more money off of, but they're like, still expecting their sales to be flat or less. Seems bad. Josh, how much longer do you think Funko is going to be around? Oh, I don't know. If they're still making $1.1 billion a year, I think it might not be all doom and gloom for them. But uh, I do definitely see a ton of more clearance Funko Pops uh, on the shelves than yeah. I did before. And I don't really know that I see any marketing for it or know anyone who actively collects them anymore. So, right. I mean, I could definitely see that. But I also, at what point do you run out of things you've already done? So they put out so many Funko Pops yeah. that people just might not be interested anymore. But I know they do other things besides Pops. Like they have some board game stuff. Uh, I'm sure they have. Well, not some, really because like, they just sold that company. Oh, that's you're right. They did do that. <laughs> but they did do that, yeah. They did do that. Yeah. So I don't know. That's interesting. But I don't know. What do we think? GameStop's still around. We thought GameStop was going to be gone three well, years ago. Well, we'll talk ago. about that when we get to the yeah. game part. We'll uh, see. So I don't know. Maybe we still see them in 2030. Uh, maybe they still have a decade left in them. Yeah. I don't know. We'll see. When was the last time you bought a Funko Pop? I bought actually not too long ago. Oh, okay. uh, which one did I buy recently? I bought one recently. Uh, so probably within the last, for myself, within the last six months, for my wife, probably two months ago. Okay. I think the last time I bought one was roughly 2017. <laughs> oh, okay. Yeah, that was yeah. a while ago. <laughs> it's been a bit. It's been a bit about a couple Overwatch ones back then. Um, so yeah, it's been a while, but I, yeah, I just don't, maybe they will become, maybe they'll still exist, but they'll really shrink and it'll become more niche and more boutique. And then, you know, I could see them potentially like holding on, but you know, with their total sales are more like less than half of what they're doing now. I could right. see them potentially, you know, if they become very boutique, very specialized, um, maybe then they can still stick around. But well, we'll it also see. says interim CEO. So maybe there's some more yeah. stuff going on there. <laughs> yeah. Well, and you know, 
hired, brought in to try to turn things around, make all the tough decisions so everyone can hate you, and then you hire the real CEO uh, so that they can then hopefully be liked. That's but can you really blame on Amazon on, on that much of a loss? <laughs> oh no, I mean no, <laughs> that's a yeah. ba- that's a cra- that's a crazy statement. Yeah, it really is. So cool. Um, so you know, continuing on with like the not great news. But I guess partially good news. But hobby game sales eked out a tough win in 2023. Again, over from the folks at ICV2. Hobby game sales eked out a nominal 1% increase in 2023. Up is up. Uh, Yep. Up is up. Exactly. Against a tough comparison (laughs) to a third great year of COVID fuel sales in 2022. Yeah. Increases in collectible game and miniature sales offset declines in board, cart, and RPG sales. Um, So for them, they're defining hobby games as those games produced for a quote-unquote gamer market. Um, so primarily the hobby channel. So not really for the most part looking at, you know, retail things, looking much more at your friendly local game stores, um, your card specialty stores, those sorts of things. Um, the total hobby game market estimate is derived from the estimates for five individual categories, collectible games, uh, miniatures, board games, card and dice games, and role-playing games. So those are kind of the things that they're looking at. Now, what's important to note uh, is that, um, you know, in 2023, things were up one percent. So there was a they estimate 2.885 billion in 2023 as far as their sales go. Um, however, it's important to note in that in the previous three years, the total gaming uh, hobby game sales have gone up 70 percent. Oh, okay. So they are still yes, it was a very minimal increase, but compared to four years ago, they're yeah. way way up. So total hobby game sales in um 2019 were 1.675 um million and or billion, excuse me, and now we're up to 2.885 billion. So yes, you know compared to 2.860 last year, um, but in 2020 it was just over two billion. 2021 was 2.6 billion. Uh, 2022 was 2.86 billion, and then 2023 was 2.88 billion. So yes, very minimal increase. But if you you know look from just a few years prior, um, still huge growth has happened. So even the fact that it went up one percent uh, is is pretty impressive. Um, so yeah, Josh, thoughts on board games growing still, but barely. Thoughts there? Hey, you'd love to see it. At least they're still growing. Who would have thought? This is, well, yeah, it's definitely slowing down for me, but that's just the time and collection space thing that's really holding me back. And uh, I do believe if I had more active game nights, I would still be as invested as I was five, six, seven years ago. So um, I think it's still great. It's not. It's still nice to see. Uh, like driving by a place and randomly see a game store you didn't even know existed just pops up and having options and seeing a wider variety of games in mass retail stores as well. So, yeah. Yeah. So it is important to note that collectible and miniatures were the only two 2023 growth categories. Board games, card games, and role-playing games were all down. Um, oh, wow. and for them, collectibles includes like our includes CCGs and TCGs, so like your Lorcanas, your Magics, all of that stuff is considered a collectible. Um, and then obviously we know our miniatures games are. So when we talk about you know your more pr- traditional games, actually, uh, those are all down. It, it really is you know the TCGs and minis games that are up right now, and that's kind of it. So those more lifestyle, if you would, games are the ones that are kind of pushing the market forward. So. Yeah. So yeah, so Josh, do you think in 2024 will we see another increase, or where do you think will happen this year? Yeah, I mean, I think TCG is still going strong. Magic keeps putting out sets. We have Lorcana now, finally being able to contribute with actual stock. Uh, yeah, you know, in Pokemon, I keep seeing new sets come out, so I think that's still strong. I see. Do they include baseball cards now in that too? Because Something that Lorcana has really brought me into is I did not realize the craziness there is for these people buying these box booster boxes of of sports cards. I didn't even know that was a thing that was still happening, and I, I've just been running into them, like trying to get Lorcana cards. I'm running into these like insane collectors of sports cards. I thought that died out a long time ago. Uh, I think it's still a thing, um, which is similar. I think, you know, just to like, I think most people would assume that Pokemon cards too, like went out a long time ago. Um, 
but no, they're still a thing. They're not included in this. Um, this was games only, so TCG, CCG is not like trading cards um, or sports. Never cards. makes sense. Yeah. yeah. So that is an inter- another interesting um, area, though, because I used to collect baseball cards big time, and I just kind of fell off yeah. um, because there was that point in the '90s where. They tried to make everything rare, and then everyone's like, "Oh my gosh, all my grandparents, all my grandpa's baseball cards are worth a ton." So just everyone kept everything, and then nobody got rid of anything, and then nothing was worth anything because of that. Then maybe that's changed now, unless you had, you know, a King Griffey Junior. rookie card. Um, but yeah. I do. <laughs> <laughs> so speaking of, you know, kind of a way to look at that hobby game sales, you know, barely had an increase really from those collectible card games and the miniatures games. Um, one thing that Stonemeyer does is they are very transparent about how they do each year. Um, and I think this is probably going to be a pretty clear indication as to, you know, what board games are doing right now. Um, and Stonemeyer sales dropped for a second year in the row in a, in a row. Um, and this is from again, ICV two, that Stonemaier game sales declined for a second consecutive year in 2023, according to the company's annual report. Stakeholders from founder Jamie Stegmeier, friend of the watch well, and say friend of the show, previous person who's been on the show, and he seems very nice. <laughs> yeah, uh, Stonemaier game sales were 16.7 million in 2023, down around 19 percent from the company's 20.7 million sales in 2022, and off 32 percent from the 24.7 million in sales in 2021. Stone Iron's biggest year since the company started releasing stakeholder reports in 2016. So 2021, their biggest year, um, they were at 24.7 million. This year, or 2023, they were at 16.7 million dollars. However, Transfer Stone Myers overall sales tracked closely with the sales of flagship title Wingspan, which also peaked in 2021 at 663,548 copies. Um, last year's sales were 208,000, and according to the lifetime numbers, they're at now basically just shy of 1.9 million copies of Wingspan sold. Important thing to note, if you're more of a video game listener for a board game, that's a ton. That is so many games for a board game. (laughs) That is like ridiculous. Um, As was his practice, Stegmeier did not disclose profits, but did note that the company was more profitable on lower sales in 2023 than it was in 2022 due to improved partnerships and logistics. Uh, Stonemeyer went to exclusive hobby distribution through GTS and to warehouse and fulfillment by miniature market instead of greater than games during 2022. Sales of 2023 releases Scythe, Sequel Ex- Expeditions, and Apiary were good by hobby board game standards. Um, so Expeditions sold about 70,500 copies and Apiary sold 30,000 copies, which again, that is good for a hobby board game, but still an order of magnitude, obviously smaller than Wingspan. Uh, but Wormspan, the first 2024 release, um, the initial print run's been 100,000 units. So a little bit of a bounce back there as far as things go. So Josh, uh, Stonemeyer profitable still, more profitable than they were in the past, but game sales have definitely decreased. Thoughts on the health and uh, of Stonemeyer games? Well, I mean, they are, they're a very niche, niche yeah. board game company, so they definitely have a specific fan base. And not all their games are accessible. I would also, I would probably argue, Wingspan became their most accessible game oh, yeah. to a wider audience. So it definitely brought more attention to them. But I think most of their games are heavy and complicated for the most part. So I feel like I would imagine their sales. I mean, I was ex- I was ex- uh, surprised to see it was a nineteen percent drop. Because uh, and maybe that's just based off of releases for them, but I just assume that, like, if you're a Stonemaier Games person, you're always buying them, and you're probably buying them directly from them, right? Uh, at this point, so, um, yeah, it's curious, it's interesting that this is happening. Hopefully, uh, it picks up for Jamie, like, because he's also very hands on and he's very passionate about what he does, and pandemic hit them pretty hard uh, as well. So, I mean, as it did everybody, but like he was giving you that news and letting you know. So, well, well hopefully and I think it gets it's, good. Yeah. And I think it is important to keep in mind that, you know, 60.7 million in sales, obviously that's down, but he did say they were more profitable. And I think Stone Miner has two full time employees. It's him and one of the person, it, I think. Yeah, yeah. You know, so yeah, you're like, oh, six, you know, that's a, you know, <laughs> eight million drop in two years you're also supporting two people right and and maybe it's more than that i'm sure they pay contractors and things like that but they only have two full-time employees you know so it's not like uh it's a little bit different you know that compared to 
you know, video game companies and and, uh, and even something like Asthma Day or something like that. Yeah, I, I think it's just two people. So, but cool. Um, other than that, just, you know, some quick header things. Uh, Embracer um, sold off Miniature Market. So Miniature Market was owned by Asthma Day. Obviously, Embracer has been selling a ton of people, which we'll talk about a little bit later. But they did um, spin out Miniature Market. So it was um, uh, purchased by a capital group, a Square One Capital um and then uh, kind of an interesting new tcg got funded um through kickstarter and it's called altered and what's neat about it is that once you buy the cards physically or receive the card physically there's a qr code you can scan on it and then you also have the card digitally um which is kind of neat so we'll see how that does it was just on kickstarter raised over seven million dollars uh so we'll see if that takes off and that if that becomes a model for other other games moving forward because that is pretty interesting it's something people have asked for i just will be very interested because i have to imagine the investment to maintain <laughs> an online game like that in addition to the paper version of it has to be extremely expensive so we'll see what, how that works out I, I wish them the best of luck though all right josh moving on to video game stuff anything in the video game news pop it out at you anything you'd like to discuss yeah let's talk about this game right here this game that came out that i mentioned to you uh, so this game Marvel Rivals was announced. Uh, <laughs> yeah, it was. And uh, I think I, at least the first day it was announced, I'm pretty sure nobody really knew what it was. Uh, they just had some like ideas of uh, what kind of game it might be potentially. I think there's a lot of rumors going on. Also, I don't. I'm not in. I know you're in the rumor mill. I'm. I'm not in that mill. Yeah. I'm in the I, as a brick wall between my mill and your mill, so I don't see. Gotcha. And here are the rumors, but so I was pretty surprised when this came out. So I was, it popped up in our Discord. People are like, "Who wants this?" What I read was FPS, and I was like, "Okay, that's interesting." Uh, and that you know that was before the game was announced, and Don, Donnie kind of nailed it that I was probably the only person interested in any Marvel news at this point <laughs> in our Discord. Um, so that uh, being said, that that they did drop a trailer the next day, and uh, yeah, if you didn't know any better, I would say all it is is uh, Marvel DLC for Overwatch, right? You get the Marvel yeah. costumes to <laughs> play. Uh, it's like it's a six v six hero shooter, uh, and it's it's uh, honestly it. it it's perfect for me. <laughs> uh, I don't know how much, like, I really liked Overwatch as well, right? But I never got into, like, you have, like, an Overwatch group. I would just play when we'd have, like, PSVG game nights or casual game nights. Um, because I like to play with people I know. And yeah. it's different uh, to me when I'm playing with two other people I, I'm unfamiliar with. Or three other people. Sorry, yeah, two other people. I uh, mean, that, yeah. When I played that, when I was playing Overwatch last night, I, I had somebody tell me I was horrible. So you know, it's great. Oh yeah, it's, because people it's are a so friendly, nice, welcoming community. Right? Yeah, it's, it's amazing. Yeah, I, and so. I and I don't like that aspect of it. In fact, it it upsets me enough that I actively avoid playing with people I don't know because I just assume that that's going to happen. Yeah, <laughs> even no, if I mean, it doesn't admittedly, happen. I was playing like crap. Like admittedly, sure, but, I was like, not playing well. I was on. having a very bad game. Yeah. You, you're, you're not making. One point five million dollars a quarter for playing for the Astros. You're playing sure. Overwatch at home. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> so, anyways, yeah. So uh, we get uh, we got Black Panther, Doctor Strange, Groot, Hulk, Iron Man, Loki, Luna Snow, which my buddy had to ask me who that was, um, and I just go to Wiki, you'll find her. Uh, Magic, Magneto, Mantis, Namor, Penny Parker, The Punisher. Rocket Raccoon, Scarlet Witch, Spider Man, Storm, and Star Lord. We saw about a, three quarters of them in the trailer, uh, and they left off what will uh, ultimately be probably um, not in the initial, like <laughs> when you open the game to play it, run. I'm going to guess they're going to put a character out every couple months or so. Oh, yeah. I mean, this is a free to play game, Josh. So, yeah, and, and it's net ease, right? So, yeah, it's yeah. going to be, it's definitely going to have some uh, roll your eyes moments, I'm sure, especially with those battle passes and stuff. 
Um, but I will certainly check it out because I think it looks very cool and a lot of fun. And the fact that you can be Rocket Raccoon and jump on Groot's shoulder and do a team attack is pretty freaking cool. It is pretty cool. <laughs> uh, it is, you know, it is mostly Overwatch. There are some changes and things, different things, right? Like the group attack, like you just talked about. Yes. It does seem that this is it's third person right yeah yeah. so which is different obviously because you know overwatch is first person uh it does seem that this is mostly melee focused there are i I think they said only like a handful of characters that actually have like projectiles uh but with that being and there is some parts of the environments that are destructible so those are all things that are are different than, than overwatch with that being said uh the team like the roles of the players uh the team like yeah overwatch isn't 6v6 anymore but like 6v6 versus 5v5 the game modes uh the maps like all of that stuff looks very overwatchish oh, yeah. right like <laughs> as far as how you do those things uh and the abilities of some of the people are just straight up overwatch abilities <laughs> like not even like just exactly overwatch abilities which though one could argue overwatch easily could have been uh inspired by if you have a character like luna snow who is going to be in a game like what would her abilities be and that is what may is like you could make that argument in a way too like sure. you could say that they were inspired by marvel and this is just marvel reclaiming it whatever uh i <sighs> here's the thing i have so- like overwatch for the last like month has been real rough uh i have ha- i'm having the least fun playing overwatch right now that i've ever had and which is weird because they did this huge patch that initially made it really good. Um, but right now, it just feels to be in a really crummy spot. Um, playing tank is miserable. It just, it, there's, I have no fun doing it. It just okay. is horrible right now. And the things that they did to make the game in some ways more accessible, I don't know. I don't, shouldn't even say that because that's not totally it. Basically, the changes they made made the characters that grief the best characters in the game. Yeah. So all the characters who make playing less fun because they either basically don't have to aim when they hit you or they go invisible or like all of that kind of stuff or like the really big crowd control or like all the things that are you're like i just want to play the game and you're doing all the things that don't let me play the game like those are the strongest things right now in the game and that just is really unfun so it's like well we can just do the same thing back which is not fun for anyone then Um, (laughs) or we can try to counter it right with with the characters that might counter it but then because of how the 5v5 structure is like communication is so important that yeah it's we were playing last night and um one of the pe- uh, one of the people i play with is like so when's this marvel game come out again <laughs> like I mean, that's like how bad our games were going like it was it was really rough so uh yeah i will definitely try this it is i don't think it's supposed to come out until 2025 i know yeah. that the yes alpha kicks off in may on pc only it's supposed to be from what they've said or what things are saying it's gonna be pc console not mobile uh, so we'll see. I'll definitely try it. I probably will even try it, sign up to try the beta, the alpha. Uh, I do wonder if it's going to allow controller usage or if it's just going to be mouse and keyboard in the alpha because that could be pretty rough for me because I am really bad at mouse and keyboard. Uh, but I'm interested at least to try it out um, to see what it's like. Uh, I do this. <laughs> There's a big uh, interesting like wave of people really wanting Overwatch to go back to 6v6 right now because playing tank is so miserable. Uh. Um, but like <laughs> nobody wants to play tank. So if we just make it six V six, that's then now you not have to have two find two people who don't want to play tank to play tank. Right. Um, so that's not that's not great. Um but yeah, I'm interested. We'll see. I'm gonna keep my eyes on this. I did know this was a thing, like it's been rumored for quite a while. Um, but you know, it I again this is kind of like my Marvel's Midnight Sun. I'm like, man, this is some deep cuts for some of these characters again. Like Yes, yes. So but I am I will also be very interested in what the uh monetization will be i'll be very curious yeah, to see what that yeah. looks like so but yeah hopefully it's fun so other things in the video game world you want to talk about josh uh, da, 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 da. well there's a lot of bad news in here there's a ton of bad news in there hmm. i don't want to cover any bad news okay uh we can talk about the partner preview the xbox partner preview <laughs> we can do that. You know, Josh, it's that? been so long <laughs> since we podcasted that the partner preview they did back on like March 6th or whatever we haven't even talked about. Uh, 
Yeah, it's been so long, but that's okay. Did you watch the partner preview? I did not, actually. (laughs) (laughs) Gotcha. Okay. Well, then let's talk about the thing that neither one of us watched. I think I watched some of it. Um, Yeah, I I saw bits and pieces. I shouldn't say I didn't watch any. I watched many of the trailers, but not as part of the uh, when it was streamed. I watched them later. So So, um, did anything jump out to you? I didn't. uh, Yeah, but maybe the first one, not in a good way. That unknown nine game that... uh, Looks like another tactics based shooter, but kind of odd. It seems like yeah. they're trying to emulate some things from other games, like the guy. The guy kind of looks like the bad guy from Half Life, and uh, not the bad guy, but those guys that have suits or whatever. Um, I think I've seen that game sleight of hand. I think I've seen it a ton, and I'm just. Is it kind of point and click adventure game? What is it going to be? Is it like the there's no, I don't know what it's going to be. It's a detective style game. Yeah, it's a. Um, I'm pretty sure it's a deck builder. Is it a deck builder? Okay. Yeah, so I think I, so. Yeah, yeah, maybe I didn't catch that part, but I, I wasn't too sure about that one. Um, Creatures of Ava looked cute. Oh, you know what? This Chucky thing <laughs> <laughs> looks horrible. Uh, it looks so bad. <laughs> How did that get in a showcase? I don't know how it got in there. It doesn't make any sense. It's just like, I thought it was at least going to be like Dead by Daylight or something. At least that would have made more sense. Just Roblox and Chucky. Terrible, 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 terrible. Um, We did get the announcement. They're making The Sinking City Part 2. Yep. The Sinking City is a game that I own, I think, multiple times on PlayStation and PC. And I really want to play it. And I really think I would like it. And I just have never uh, gotten into it past like the intro. I'm like, all right, um, I must be, I must, I, I must always be playing something more exciting at the time. <laughs> Cause it's definitely like a, it's more of the like Sherlock style game where it's detective stuff. Um, but I am very interested in it. I want to like it. Um, I showed my son the trailer for the Monster Jam Showdown 2024. It looks exactly like every previous Monster Jam game. Uh, so it uh, didn't do anything for me. <laughs> uh, <laughs> my Sorry. son was excited. <laughs> I don't mean to laugh. I'm watching the trailer for that Chucky oh. game. <laughs> the Chucky game is it's so, so bad. bad. <laughs> well, you laughed at a good time. It was a good timing. Uh, that's okay. That's okay. And... Uh, Honestly, I, they showed a ton of games. Uh, I think this maybe was geared to different gamers than I am because uh, I don't. I don't know that I saw anything I that had gameplay that I was like, I want to play yeah. this game. No, I think that's. Uh, I think that's reasonable. Um, the the one thing that stuck out to me is a game that you know was announced at the Game Awards that I'm still excited about. That Tales of Kanzara, 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 Zao. Um, you know, I obviously. Earlier in the year, we had the new um, Prince of Persia game that I, re- I really enjoyed. I should I need to get back and finish, um, but this kind of looks. I don't know if it actually is a roguelike, but just this side-scrolling action game are, are things I enjoy. I know you're not as big of a fan of, uh, but uh, I, I think that game still looks really interesting. How is the hard thing is is it looks cool, but how does it feel to play? And that's the thing you can't always tell from the trailer, yeah. right? Uh, so I, that is still for me the the standout of everything here. Um, and that uh, Capcom game that um, Kinitsu Gami Path of the Goddess, I think, looks interesting. I don't totally know what it is still, I don't feel like. Um, but I, I do appreciate, and maybe this is the wrong take on it. I think this is coming to Game Pass, if I recall correctly. Um, and it, it, it really is like Capcom. I almost feel like it's Capcom being like, you know what? We're going to take that Microsoft money and we're going to use it to make this big swing. We'll see. Like, <laughs> we're going to try this weird thing. We'll see if it works. We got money sure. for it. So who cares? You know, and I, I appreciate that, right? Trying to do something a little different, maybe something that we wouldn't see if Capcom had to pay for it all itself. Maybe we're not going to see something quite as quirky or odd as this. Um, but yeah, I think it's, it'll be interesting. I think it's kind of like a tower defense ish e game, which I didn't totally anticipate it, it having that when the, the for the when I saw the first trailer for it. But we'll see. You know, Capcom they for the most part have been putting out some quality releases as of late. So for the most part, so yeah, maybe it's good. We'll see. Um, but yeah, I think those for me are the the big two that stuck out. So um, are you are you excited about Stalker? 
I mean, you know I know I, I, this never, is... I never got into the other games, so okay. um, not really. Okay, because obviously Soccer Two is still coming sometime this year. This is where you know they talked about the Soccer trilogy at the during this. Yeah, I don't know. I think it's. I'm, Stalker's kind of always been one of those games that I was like, oh, that's a game that cool people play, and I'm not very cool. Um, but maybe I can be cool, and I can play Stalker, maybe. I don't know. So, all right, Josh. Anything else, then, for video game news? Um, well, I, could, I could hear some from you. Okay, so here's where we're going to go, then. We're going to go to what I think. I don't know. I thought this would be the thing that you're going to talk about. Um, <laughs> first off, so... You know, Embracer Group, they've been uh, in its a rough shape. They've been offloading stuff, closing stuff, canceling stuff. And, you know, we, we're we not going to necessarily talk about Saber because Saber got spun off and, and became independent. So they've freed themselves from Embracer. And they're kind of their own thing now. Um, So that is something that happened, you know, in, between the last time that we recorded and now. Uh, but in addition to that, then it be, kind of became rumored that, hey, in addition to that, Gearbox is going to be spun out again. Um, they're going to go somewhere else, and nobody was really sure exactly where, but it does seem like they probably landed at the place that makes the most sense, um, and that um, Embracer Group has divested Gearbox Entertainment from a stable of video game studios, with Take-Two Interactive purchasing the company for $460 million. Now, Josh, important thing to note that uh, Embracer bought Gearbox for $1.3 billion. Yeah. <laughs> and now sold them to Take-Two for $460 million. What a I don't understand why I can't get ahead in business because I can make bad decisions like that. Come on. <laughs> why can't I do these things? What a deal. What a deal. Yeah, to so, two yeah. me out like uh, uh, <laughs> very well. <laughs> um, this does mean that Embracer no longer owns Gearbox development entities such as Gearbox Software, Gearbox Montreal, and Gearbox Studios Quebec, nor franchises such as Borderlands slash Tiny Teens Wonderlands, Homeworld, Risky Rain, Brothers in Arms, and Duke Nukem. Good thing they kept Duke Nukem because, you know, that's – can't let that go. Um, these assets will be acquired by Take Two, which owns Rockstar Games and 2K, among other labels. Um, all of these other typical things. Now, the big thing being, though, that um, Take Two, obviously, publisher of Borderlands. So, them now really locking down Borderlands is, makes total sense. Yeah. Uh, but with this, they also confirmed during this news that Borderlands 4 though we all assumed was in development it is officially in development that was kind of that was confirmed josh you are long known to be a fan of gearbox you are long yeah. known to be a fan of borderlands even though i finished borderlands 3 and you didn't well, that's a um, bad game <laughs> <laughs> what are your thoughts on gearbox being picked up by take two what are your thoughts on borderlands 4 is there something you want to see from borderlands 4 what would make you say that borderlands 4 is not a bad game what are your thoughts sir uh, oh boy, that's a lot of questions. Um, I think it's good for them because they get to keep making games, right? So that's good. Right. At least someone has uh, some investment in them as a company. They're also not a very huge company either. Uh, so it's nice to see that. Hopefully, they'll avoid some layoffs at least for now. And I don't know what Borderlands 4 needs to be. Um, I don't know what they lost between two and three, but they lost something for me. Yeah. Um, I can, maybe I think maybe they got maybe different writers. I know they had a lot of issues uh, with their voice staff and some stuff going on that was problematic with that. Um, so I don't know if they lost that charm when all that ugliness stuff happened. But I mean, Borderlands Three just it was fun for what I played, but I just never felt the need to keep playing because I was just just getting stale for me. And Borderlands Two. Is just like better than so much better than Borderlands one because they figured out what they had. And they were yeah. able to write that storytelling to make it like every moment in Borderlands two is fun and new. And I think Borderlands three was like, Hey, everything is the same and repetitive. It, you know, used to be fun, but nothing was surprising me playing it. Like, Oh my gosh, we haven't seen that before. So that's what I need from Borderlands four, I guess. Right. Like do something different. Keep your formula. Do something different. The the gun looter shooter stuff, all the guns, a gazillion bagillion bajillion guns. Yeah. Keep all that, but like mix up your game. Don't make a tactics game. That's not what I'm saying. But <laughs> like you can keep it a shooter, mix it up, go somewhere different. Uh, I don't know, but they got to find something to to make it what it was. 
Do you think if they were to do that, do they still call it Borderlands? Do you want like Borderlands Cola? Because that's kind of like, you know, in yeah. some ways what yeah. Tiny Tina's Wonderlands is supposed to be. And I, I think my complaint, my issues with Tiny Tina's Wonderlands, even though I enjoyed it overall, was that it wasn't enough of it because you're still basically just got guns right yes. like there wasn't it wasn't enough medieval fantasy stuff like there was some but i wanted it more in that um what then for like do you want borderland like is it keeping the same idea keeping the same art style which is obviously very unique but then it's like just you don't have claptrap like what do you do to be different but still be borderlands yeah i mean that's a good point maybe don't do a borderlands for maybe do a new ip uh, I don't think that they can do that though. They have a Borderlands movie coming out, which by all means looks also terrible. Um, yeah. <laughs> but they're not going to want to put out a Borderlands movie and not have a a new Borderlands game for people to play. So maybe we get four this year or announced this year, and then they do something different next year. Yeah. So as clarification, Gearbox says they have six titles total in the works. Five are sequels. Two of those sequels are from the Borderlands and Homeworld franchises. It is also announced they have a new IP in development. So you have to assume Borderlands 4 is one of them. A Homeworld sequel is one of them. I assume a Tiny Tina's Wonderland sequel is one of them. Yeah, or DLC or something. Or or something, you know. So that leaves you basically then with still two more sequels and then a new IP that they have in development. So do you think... Man, are they really making it like... if they, If that's three more sequels... Are they really making like a Duke Nukem sequel or another Duke Nukem or another I mean, Brothers in Arms? If they're doing more sequels, it has to be Brothers in Arms or Duke Nukem. <laughs> like, they don't make any other games. <laughs> Which is fine, so, yeah. but they don't right. make any other games. <laughs> so, if Claptrap is in Borderlands 4, are you yeah. playing Borderlands 4? I mean, he's going to be in Borderlands. He's not He's not getting me to Borderlands 4. <laughs> well, I just didn't know if you'd be like, well, if he's in it, I'm out. But if he wasn't in it, I would try it. No, no. Claptrap is the best. I know you do have a Claptrap on your shelf up there. so I do. And I have, yeah. I have a butt stallion right here. <laughs> nice, Funko Pop nice. edition. Oh, perfect. Speaking of Funko. <laughs> yeah. So I'll be curious. I, you know... I enjoy the Borderlands games. Um, I only I played one, two, and three. I did not do the pre sequel. I did not play yeah. for the pre sequel. Uh, was there another another that I'm Tales missing? Tales of the Borderlands. I played that. There was yeah. no other like shooter style one. That was no. just pre sequel. Yeah, pre sequel, and then Tiny Tina, okay. obviously. But yeah, yeah, and then that for sure. So. All right. Well, we'll see what uh, Gearbox does. Um, they did, you know, immediately or not long after this was announced, they did lay people off. So, yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, but so we'll see what Randy Pitchford and, and the crew do. Um, one thing that is interesting, though, is that they Gearbox Publishing is going to get renamed and apparently it's going to be sticking around. Um, because they are the ones who publish like the Remnant games and Hyperlight Breaker, oh, okay. and they have other announced, t- unannounced upcoming titles. Um, and apparently, in this deal, they are sticking around. Um, might be renamed, um, but are still going to be supporting and publishing those games. So we'll see what happens there. But I think this is probably the best thing that could have happened for Gearbox. Like I, I think they landed at the right place for them. Um, I think you know for them, this is probably the best case scenario. So. All right, Josh. Uh, another thing that, you know, quote unquote, best case scenario, potentially. Uh, I thought you were going to go right to this after talking about Marvel Rivals because yeah. you're the only one who cares <laughs> about Marvel. Uh, we did get, oddly, a trailer for a game out of GDC, which was Marvel 1943, The Rise of Hydra. Um, so this is Skydance's Captain America Black Panther game uh, that got announced first in 2022. So this is the game that Amy Henning is working on um, and has you starring slash playing as Captain America and Black Panther Azuri, who is the father grandfather of T'Challa. Um, so you basically have Captain America plus a uh, howling soul commandos soldier, Gabriel Jones. Um, and then you have Black Panther Azuri and Nanali, a Wakandan spy. So those are the four characters basically that can potentially be part of the game um, slash, or you can play in the game. Um, this is being project is being done by Skydance. Um, and that's where Amy Henning is now obviously best known for the Uncharted franchise kind of bounced around a little bit. Hasn't released a game in some time. Uh, this game is supposedly coming in 2025. 
Josh, what did you think about this trailer? What do you think about this game? Well, obviously, trailer, we know very little, but... Yeah. yeah, the trailer looks really cool. I mean, they're doing a lot of great stuff with the new Unreal Engine, so it's very yeah. impressive to see the character models, and the acting looks very good, so they're spending money on good voice acting and actors. Uh, I think it, it kind of gave me the impression that the game's going to be split up, like, and it looked like... Just based off the cinematic trailer, like you, you might be doing more Assassin's Creed style things with Black Panther and Captain America, more of the, the combat. And I can't think of what game it was, but there was a game in the past that would split characters and one was doing sneaking and one was doing more physical stuff, um, which I think worked well. I just can't remember the name of the game or games. Uh, so not that well. Um but again, yeah, it's we're too far out to know more about that. I do like that they're kind of adding a little more backstory to Captain America and and yeah. showing the Black Panther fight off Nazis uh, yeah. is pretty cool. So I like the idea. Yeah, I do appreciate that the time frame. Like, I'm actually really glad it's set when it is. Having that 1943 time is pretty cool, uh, and is something that. You know, we really typically only seen like, you know, some Call of Duties and things like that where yeah. they kind of go back to this time. So having a game set during this time that isn't, I guess, the saboteur, maybe, <laughs> um, <Right. laughs> you know, uh, do you think, okay, because you're the one who always gets on this. Huh? Is the game going to look this good when we play it? Because this trailer looks incredible. It looks so like, good. I know, I know UE5 is, does amazing things, but yeah. gosh darn, this this trailer looks so good. No, I mean, the cutscenes will, I will obviously look that good because that was one of them. But, uh, right. I mean, top, like, top tier PCs, maybe you kind of get something close, but I don't think, I don't think we'll see that. Especially, we don't even know where we're going to be console wise in 2025. Who knows what's going to happen this year? Um, but yeah, I mean, I expect it to look good, but not as good as those cutscenes good. <laughs> Yeah, because there were a couple shots that were like kind of like third person from behind. You're like, are you telling me that's what's supposed like? Because, man, those things look real good. I was like, oh, wow. It was very impressive. Very impressive tech going on there. We'll see, you know, how much of that is legit, you know, in a year or so. But uh, I'm hopeful. I know that, you know, Marvel and, and superhero things are. A little tiring for some people, but uh, if it's a fun game, I I don't care. So, um, all right, Josh, maybe one or two more things here, real quick. Um, our favorite person, Mr. Jeff Keeley, has announced that Summer Game Fest is back June seventh. Um, they will have their live show. Uh, there will be a live stream beginning at two p.m. Pacific, five p.m. Eastern on June seventh. Um, you know. Summer Game Fest has now that E3 is officially toast. This is kind of the thing for the summer. Yeah. Um, and it will be returning to Los Angeles' YouTube theater for announcements, first look trailers, and more this June. So the uh, following the June 7th showcase, an invite-only media and influencer event will happen in downtown LA for hands-on gameplay and upcoming games will return uh, from June 8th to the 10th. So looks like June 7th, we're going to have this, you know, presser event, whatever. And then for a couple of days after that, you know, that kind of more traditional opportunity for press to go hands on with things. Uh, Josh, number one, excitement level for what now really is the replacement free three, right? There's yeah. no other if answer or thoughts about it. This is the replacement free three. And anything you think we'll see or anything you'd want to see there? Uh, I like it. I don't love the format necessarily, but I at least like that we're still getting game news and it's still existing in some form uh and we can actually have like a time of the year that to celebrate it and look forward to big announcements instead right. of like they can they still trickle out during the year but obviously like knowing that you can rely on some big stuff that you know kind of people like me who like the what's in the box kind of people like the most exciting <laughs> part of the gift is not knowing what it is right um I think those people like that's great. Like we have that time. Uh, uh, what am I gonna? What do I? Th- I don't know. We'll see. Maybe we'll finally get some eyes on Fable. Um, I think we're still too far away from Mass Effect and Dragon Age, but I will say Bioware has been 
has at least put out something new for Mass Effect recently and something new for Dragon Age recently. It's not big content or anything, but at least it's word that they're still working on those to some degree. Um, but even if it's like that Marvel 1943 thing and we get a 2025 or 26 date just to show something or like anything, please. Well, I do think <laughs> if I recall, and again, I am definitely not as in tune as I was back at, you know, pre doctorate stuff, but they didn't EA say that we were going to see Dreadwolf this summer. And that is, and, uh, and people are saying it's still potentially on track for this fall for a release. I don't, I don't know. I don't remember. Maybe I don't doubt it, but I don't remember hearing that. Yeah, I, I feel like they said we were going to see Dreadwolf this summer at least. That that part I feel pretty confident in. Uh, the you know fall release, I, like I said, I think that's been a rumor from insiders. I don't know if that is still on track, but I feel like they said this summer we would see it. Fair, 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 fair. I hope so. I would love to see what's going on with them. Yeah. Um. Do you think? xbox does a separate event or do they do something have they said they're doing a separate event and i just forgot that no i don't (laughs) think so i think they will do a separate event because that's just kind of business as usual for them but i don't know that they anyone else has announced anything yet yeah besides some of the first yeah i i do anticipate that we will um i think playstation will have some stuff there i think playstation is going to do their own showcase though maybe in may yeah yeah, they think, usually do it a bit early, right? Yeah, so I could see them potentially doing one in May a little bit early, but then still having some stuff at Summer Game Fest. Because, I mean, you know, obviously Xbox, we kind of know what they have coming this year still. And and really into the future, we, we have an idea. And I think some of their fall games especially could use a look, whether it be at their own showcase um, or doing a little bit at their showcase and then doing some things at Summer Game Fest. That could definitely happen. Um, obviously, Hellblade will be out by this time already. But um but for playstation like we really don't know like what concord and fair games and other than that like we really don't know what's going on for them for the most part so i i do think that they need to do either a showcase and or um something big at summer game fest because they obviously have a pretty strong up through april this year with with stellar blade uh but then after that we really don't know much of anything um and i think that's something they need to step up on so i could see them doing their own thing or playing a a significant role in this. And I would like to see them do that. Uh, Do you think star Wars outlaws comes out before summer game fest or no? No, I don't think so. So I assume then Ubisoft will be there to show that at the very least. Yeah. Um, I'm trying to think of, Oh, and probably next assassin's creed too. Right. Yeah. Well, they just delayed Jade, right? Jade was the mobile one. They just delayed one of them. Maybe yeah, it's they the, delayed the mobile one. Okay, yeah, so, which is Jade, Red, which is the one that takes place in Japan and is supposed to be yeah. next, which is supposedly coming this fall. Um, I, I think we likely could see that there. This does seem like a time though too, where like especially Xbox could do something big with Call of Duty if there is a fall Call of Duty potentially. Those delays have been getting later, or those reveals have been getting later and later um but i could see something you know obviously they want that at their own event too but i think that that would be a big pop um at summer game fest like having the call of duty logo and having the xbox logo you know like that would yeah. be i think pretty big for them um do you think so, yeah. they still do a blizzcon ah, that's a good question uh they still did or they still do um what is quakecon don't they Oh, I don't know, actually. I think they still do QuakeCon. So yeah. if they still do QuakeCon, I would assume that they would still do BlizzCon. Yeah. So now, what are you going to talk about for a BlizzCon? Right? Well, that's we they, they that could then talk about Microsoft stuff, though. So they'll have that ability to do that. I guess. I guess. Yeah, that's true. I guess they could. But at QuakeCon, I don't think they do. I think it's very much like Quake and that's just focus still. Yeah. Yeah. But that's like a singular thing. BlizzCon was yeah. like multiple games. Yeah, but it was all Blizzard properties, though, right? And realistically, yeah. like if your survival game or whatever the other game that their their new IP is canceled, yeah. Diablo just came out. Obviously, we're gonna have a Warcraft expansion, a World of Warcraft expansion. But we get right. those all the time. What are you gonna say about Overwatch? That yeah. it's not, <laughs> that you've ruined it. Like, what else you want? Like, what else are you gonna say about it? Right? Like, uh, maybe they announced that StarCraft is coming back. Like, you know, like what are they gonna <laughs> right. do? Right? right? Like, um, but I do think that xbox could especially since they do have so many studios and publishers now under them 
that they easily could do like bespoke like Xbox events, Blizzard events and Bethesda events. And I think in some ways, while yes, it makes sense to put like all of your big hitters together. I actually think they might start cannibalizing each other then because you have so many of them. Um, and so it might be it might serve them better that yeah like all the activision blizzard stuff happens at blizzcon and that's where they do, they do talk about call of duty and they do talk about like that kind of stuff and you know all of your El- i was gonna say elden ring elder scrolls stuff and like all of that stuff happens separately i could see a, a world where that would work and maybe i'm interested in that but yeah interesting cool well hey summer game fest that's a horrible time uh because i definitely cannot watch it but that's cool um thanks for having on a friday afternoon i don't none of us have work um so uh to do anything else here a whole bunch of people got laid off because everything still sucks um so that was horrible i just i can't it's just insane to me like how wrong everyone was and it was like everyone i just don't understand it how about GameStop? Well, no, not GameStop. Just about like <laughs> no. super massive laid off a lot of people. But this is like to yes. tell you how long it's been since we podcast. PlayStation laid off nine hundred yes. people and shut down uh, <laughs> London Studio, which I don't want to brag about something like this because it's not appropriate. But I'm just gonna kind of do it anyway, I guess. Um, <laughs> uh, in our Discord, when the Insomniac leaks happened and they talked about studios closing, in our Discord, I was like, no, it's gonna be London, hmm. and. I just want to say, you know, in November, because what what was the last game that London released, Josh? Do you know? No, but I also couldn't tell you what any of the 19 Ubisoft studios right. <laughs> put out either. Uh, Josh, it was the VR game Blood and Truth. Oh, OK. Which You're was a, a good game. Fun game. game. Yeah. yeah, fun game. Right. I, I really enjoyed Blood and Truth. Before that, they did VR Worlds. OK, but that was bad. Yeah, oh, it was yeah. OK. It wasn't bad. And before that, they were doing Wonder Book. So like they just haven't released like and then like and then they were doing like iToy stuff for like the PS3. They just haven't released a game of like consequence in the PlayStation world in so long that like if you are if you've been like a PlayStation console gamer, unless you were playing like iToy games on the PS3, they have not released a game you've played in more than like <laughs> 15 years. Sure. Right. So like they it seems like it makes sense that they would be the studio that you would close down. Yeah. And I don't even think they were that big. Not that it makes it okay. I'm not saying that they that should have been that way because obviously PlayStation is the one who makes a decision about what those people do. And they're the ones who decided that they were going to make, I don't want to say worthless things, but niche products. Right. And then you get upset they don't sell well. Well, I wonder why, you know, yeah. like imagine that person who <laughs> right. made the decision about those things. But when we look at PlayStation laying off 900 people, it really does make me wonder about Connie Booth leaving and Jim Ryan leaving and Connie Booth clearly was not like her choice. I wonder if Jim Ryan actually truly was his choice or not. Right. Because they've also theoretically canceled half their live service games, or at least are revisiting half of them. Um, some of them we know are not happening. Uh, I, it, it does seem that, you know, for all of the crap we give Xbox for their inability to manage their first party studios last four years, doesn't seem like PlayStation has been doing a killer job of it either. Right. Like it really seems, and obviously the pandemic messed a lot of things up, but y- it may be that you know it's unfair probably that jim ryan gets to quote unquote retire yeah. um where of 900 other people yeah, just got laid off job, yeah. yeah you know um but I, I do wonder how much dissension um there was in the ranks there and part of the big rumors of the past were that you know when jim ryan became head that there was a big battle between like playstation us and playstation europe and Sheldon laden and jim ryan like kind of duking it out for who's going to take control of playstation and obviously jim ryan won right like um so i do i always sometimes kind of wonder like what what things would look like if sean laden had been in control like today like right like what things uh, you know how things would have would look in a, if they would be different because he was the one on his way out who's like games are too expensive they're way too expensive to make we gotta do something different this yeah. isn't gonna work right he was he was that guy on his way out so i, I do wonder um well, what, we're getting closer to the universal console. We are getting closer. Um, Everyone's going to shut, just develop. They're, and they're not, you know, no more console sales or just all digital. It's like Netflix for games. So PlayStation's Netflix, Xbox is Netflix. 
Nintendo will still be handheld, and you'll have to go buy physical copies of games for eighty dollars. But everything else will be digital. <laughs> <laughs> Nintendo will be the one that holds on. It is kind of bizarre though, like going in stores now. Like there's just like no games. There's no games. Yeah, yeah. There's like no games anywhere, and yeah, it just is so interesting. And just listening to people talk about the industry, and we're obviously not experts, and this is actually something I want to talk to you about more, probably off air but like it doesn't seem like anyone knows what they're doing right <laughs> like it, it, it's a whole bunch of people talking about like well theoretically like and and maybe they don't know right like if things the world has gotten so like topsy-turvy over the last few years that like maybe the ubiquitous future you know the so one console ubiquitous future is what's going to happen right that there's gonna be one console we're all going to use everyone else is just a game publisher and that's just the thing that we do right and this is not a Xbox is dead thing, so please don't take it that way. But it, it kind of seems like Xbox is like testing the waters on that, right? They're like, hey, we're going to make this handheld thing. Everyone can play whatever on it. That's fine. We're going to test that out, see how that goes. But in addition, we're going to start putting our games everywhere because we still want to exist as a publisher of software and services. Like, we still want to be a services thing, right? Like, because that's what yeah, Microsoft is really good at providing services, you know? So it's interesting to see that just the perspectives on these things and, and how long things are going to last. It just seems like no one knows what they're doing with all these layoffs. Like I said, super massive 90 PlayStation 900 deck nine, 20% of their staff, EA 670. Like we've had other layoffs in the interim. It just, man, just really, really seems like people don't know what's going on. Agreed. Anyway, that's my rant. Anything to add to that, Josh? <laughs> no, no, no. It's okay. perfect. But Hey, you know what? Last year, banger year for games. This year so far, banger year for games. So apparently the industry is doing something right, which is producing good games. What they're doing poorly is managing talent and money and all that good stuff. So awesome. All right. Well, with that, we will begin to wrap this show up. So we're going to move on to our recommendations for a well-rounded life. Obviously, we're a gaming podcast, but we want to give you one other thing we're currently into that's helping us live that well-rounded life. Josh, what is your recommendation this month? Well, not uh, it's not piggybacking if I do it first, so preempting right, your I preempting your recommendation. Um uh, I was struggling on what to put. Um but I I did I don't think I mentioned this yet since it came back. Uh one of my beloved shows at midnight, it used to be hosted by Chris Hardwick, was canceled many years ago on Comedy Central. It's one of my favorite shows to watch. It was a daily sh like on every night. So now at or it's after midnight. After midnight was on. It's on CBS, or you can stream it on Paramount Plus. It's Monday through Thursday. It's on late. It's on after. Uh, Stephen who's Colbert. On CBS Colbert. Yeah. Yep. Um, and it's hosted by Taylor Tomlinson, and I think she's very funny and uh, personable. So she's. I think she's a good host. And it's you know they get uh three celebrity well, it's, sorry three comics three stand up com comedians or improvisers sometimes celebrities uh i know most of these people cuz i i listen to like improv podcasts all day um and they tell jokes basically if i'm using social media like tiktok and instagram and stuff and it's a game show sort of where the points don't matter uh so it's just people having fun and uh, I really enjoy it. So if you haven't checked it out, check out uh, After Midnight and it's the ampersand midnight symbol. And it's good. I agree. Um, and hey, speaking of Taylor Tomlinson, uh, Taylor Tomlinson's new stand-up special, Have It All, is out on Netflix. came out in February. Uh, I also am a huge Taylor Tomlinson fan. I think she's hilarious. Um, and her new stand-up special is also very very good i don't think it's as good as her other two it, it but it's not like dramatically not as good type of a thing and i might like the other two more just because i've seen them more i don't know necessarily but um her new stand-up special have it all is out on netflix i highly recommend giving it a listen uh she, she's just really really funny um so she's pretty great she's pretty good um i really enjoy her the other thing i will say though that i've been watching that i didn't recommend and in case i forget recommending it next month depending on because i haven't finished the series yet um, but I started watching Warrior on Max oh, on okay. Netflix now too, yeah. um, which I think just I had it like queued up on Max for a while to watch, and I finally watched it. Um, it's three seasons. It is a crime drama that takes place in the later half of the 19th century um, in San Francisco, like kind of about the gang wars in San Francisco's Chinatown. 
Um, and it is uh, supposedly like based on the writings of Bruce Lee. Uh, and it's pretty great. <laughs> like I'm really surprised at how much I'm enjoying this show. Uh, it's only three seasons. I'm halfway through season two. Um, and it's been extremely interesting so far. Um, season one, it uh, I think it took a little to get into. It's not bad by any means. Um, but from everything I have been told, season two and three are better um, than season one. And so far, season two, I think I'm on episode like four or five. Um, has been great. So if you are looking for a show that has some interesting characters, some fun fights, uh, scenes, some interesting perspectives on things, got kind of a little bit of a older, like it's kind of a Western, but not really kind of like a gangster movie, but not or a gangster show, but not really. Uh, it's got little portions of all of these things. Uh, Warrior is pretty great. It is technically was an HBO show slash Mac show, uh, but it is currently also streaming on Netflix as part of their partnership that you know warner brothers just wants money so they're putting things giving me money <laughs> exactly <laughs> all right so let's that let's go ahead and wrap things up how's that sound josh sounds good to me uh thanks for joining us everyone in addition to finding us on twitter and instagram and that's on x and instagram we're barely we're not really doing social media anyway no we're so really not don't worry about it uh at board with vg you can find us on facebook where's theirs yeah we are there at facebook.com slash board with vg so feel free to give us a five-star rating over there. Uh, also, if you want to communicate with us in the more long form or you're just not feeling social media, please feel free to email us at boardwithvg at gmail.com. Uh, when we do post, we do hashtag boardwithvg, so you can search it, we can search it. Uh, so do the same. If you post some board game picks, use that hashtag so we can see what you're up to. And whatever podcast service you're listening to us on, we encourage you to give us a stellar rating. That is whether you're downloading us from the Dice Tower Network feed or our very own standalone board with video games feed. Uh, you can find me on all the things at Why So Serious. That's S I R R I U S. Kyle, where can people find you? So you can find me on all the usual places Twitter, Instagram, PlayStation Network, Xbox Live, Board Game Geek, all at PsychoCross, C Y C O C R O S S. As always, if you have any suggestions for future topics, be sure to reach out to us on the social media. Oh, or via the email, because we want to talk about what you want to hear about. And remember, everyone, whether it be board games or video games, never stop gaming.